again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Jim Cornette Experience, where today we answer the burning question, if Cody Rhodes can bring peace between the French Canadians, why couldn't he keep the AEW locker room from kicking a shit out of each other? And now, joining me to talk about all these things and more, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's held more peace talks than Henry Kissinger. And he got a piece every time. The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. Let me let the audience know the Cosmic Rabbi is on painkillers once again this week. I was about to say we, we revealed on your program here a few days ago on the drive through that you've recently undergone a, an experimental medical procedure involving a baboon's liver well, i wouldn't say that And now you're on you're on a combination of, of propofol and morphine i wouldn't say that either well you you know I, you don't have to I already I already did. <laughs> so but the, the big question also is if besides the mid-east peace talks that we'll get to later on is how how you feeling there brian are you back in the game i'm doing all right i'm back in the game the toughest thing about propofol is trying to spell it but uh, no, I'm okay. I'm feeling good. I'm still bruised. I'm still sore. Finishing up my painkillers, like I said, but back in action. Is it is it just a P or is it the PF or is it a PH? If I well, ask you, you know, to spell Profifol, could you do it? Probably. Well, uh, hold on. Hold on. I've seen it. I saw it in news reports on poor old Michael. P-R-O-P-O-F-O-L. Hold on, now I gotta check. P R O or P R O P O P H O L. It's either an F or a P H. It is P R O P O F O L. Bam! I thought there'd be a P H. Well, see, they lowered the P H. Now it's healthier for the environment. <laughs> well, you gotta check those P H levels, of course. Yes, remember herbal essence had the P A. Your hair just looked like a goddamn. Sack full of fucking feathers by the time you got finished with that stuff. It stripped all the oil and grease and grime and muckiness off. And you could practically float away if you had hair long enough. It was so light and fluffy. That your shampoo of choice? I, I, I used some herbal essence in the 70s. You know what? My mother, Mama Cornette, found a pearl in a bottle of Prell shampoo one time. A pearl? And and I, I can tell even possibly you are too young for that. And there's a lot of the kids out there in the audience that are going to, we don't totally get it at all. The commercial in the, in the probably the late 60s for Prell shampoo, which is pretty much goddamn your basic green shampoo back then. They didn't have all these multiple colors and kinds and applications and flavors. You could you if you just downed a bottle of Prell shampoo in those days, fuck, it'd make you dizzy. But anyway, in the commercial for Prell shampoo, which was all over the fucking television everywhere, for whatever reason, I can't remember, I was fucking seven, but they dropped the pearl in the bottle of the Prell shampoo, and you see it floating slowly. I guess to illustrate how thick it was, or whatever the fuck. I don't know what their fucking deal was. And that was a vision every time you thought of Prell shampoo, you thought of that commercial with the pearl going in the goddamn thick, gooey, green fucking shampoo. My mother goes to the store one day, buys a bottle of Prell shampoo, brings it home. Now, this is before childproof labeling and packaging and things of that nature. You just trusted that the shit that was in it was what it said on the label back then. We were tougher in those days. And she said, Jimmy, look at this one day. She was down in the bathroom when she said that. Obviously, we don't keep the shampoo in the fucking kitchen. And she showed me there was a, a pearl in the bottle of Prell shampoo that she had bought at uh, over at the grocery store, at the supermarket, as Aunt Lola used to say. Now, how do you explain something like that? I don't know. How did she explain it? Well, she couldn't. It was inexplicable. And she saved that pearl forever. We, I, I, she wasn't a jeweler by trade. And I was well uh, before my days of studying to become 
an accomplished small town bird lawyer. So neither one of us knew whether it was legitimate or whether it was just goddamn gimmick pearl. But it was a pearl. In the see, right there, that'll tell you. Well, we'll see if this episode will be a pearl this week. You, you can't compete with that. Uh, so we've covered your health. The baboon's doing well. We assume he's still on some on some drugs as well. And and we've got my mother's shampoo story out of the way. So let me. By the how's the front gate on Facebook doing? Are we getting the people in there now? There's still people tweeting that are they're waiting well there's still a lot of people waiting and they're going to be waiting and there's a lot of people trying to get in tens of thousands of people are trying to get in yes but but it, it's it's flowing it's just the bottleneck is we're getting the people in the front door and and they're slowly making their way to their seats that's right i think we just went over six thousand members that we have allowed into the official cult of cornet facebook group of course go to facebook and look for the official cult of cornet not one of the bootleg suckers out there and fill out the questions Apply to come in. If you appear to be a legitimate human being on Facebook, we will probably let you in at some point. If you are someone that may be a troll, looks like a troll, or someone that we just know causes trouble in various groups, you ain't getting in. But we'll see what happens. Or or if your address is 469 under a bridge. Well, no one has their address listed. You can't come in. Well, there's no addresses on Facebook. No well, that's the, well, well, see, that's the way you know if, it's, if he lives under a bridge, chances are he's a troll. All right, I've got a, <laughs> a, a correction to make here. What I, wait, that's, the way, that's the place you find them. A show correction? Down under or? a bridge. Okay. In the, no, that's the place you find the trolls, under a bridge and, you know, where the drainage is and there's cesspools and slimy things and trolls live under the bridge. And if you don't walk quickly... They'll reach up and grab your ankles. And then, see? You got to pay the troll toll. You'll be right there. You'll be, you have to get, yeah, you got to pay the troll toll if you want to get in this boy's hole or soul or what was it now? Was it soul or hole? This is all you and Mr. DeVito. I'm staying out of this. Nevertheless. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I got a correction. But it was an innocent assumption that I made. Apparently, when we talked about the rivals show between Triple H and Batista, I said, "Unfortunately, I said the the young lady named Angie that she that he was married to at the time he was here at OVW, she had cancer, and I, I said she had passed away. She's still alive. See what happens when you assume, Brian. See, I'm I'm giving you a learning experience here. Well, you didn't make an ass out of me. I think it was all you on this one. Well, I didn't say I'm anything about to, his wife. I hope I'm she's trying doing well. to deflect it to you some somehow. <laughs> uh, no, because I assume here's the thing. Obviously, when he became a movie star, uh, I, well, at first I heard she had gotten cancer. This was after they had left Louisville. But I okay, she had cancer. And then with the years later, when he's a movie star, I see him dating other women. I see a news report saying that he's single. And then we saw the news four or five years ago on TMZ or whatever the fuck I couldn't get away from on television that he got married or whatever. So I thought, oh, you know, guess it didn't work out. Apparently, she has been a 16-year cancer survivor and just they got divorced. So she's still around. So I re- I regret that error. I hadn't, you know, obviously kept up closely with the situation, but it, it made me feel better to know that she wasn't dead. Do you think if All you right. ever, you know, I don't know where this would happen. Probably it wouldn't happen. But if somehow you ran into Dave Batista somewhere, what do you think it would be like? Over, over at years? Spago's in Los Angeles or something. Well, what do you think it would be like? Do you think there'd be any heat? Do you think maybe he'd be appreciative of... The time in OVW looking back now, how do you see him now? Like, wh- where do you think you guys would be if you ran into each other randomly? I don't know. I, he seems to be now a thoughtful, you know, reflective uh, individual and, you know, uh, just uh, blah, blah, blah. And has studied acting and various pursuits. He got to write politics. Um, you know, I was never mad at him till he went away when I heard the shit that he said uh, after the fact. Never had a crossword with him while he was here, so maybe it'd be good, maybe it, or maybe it would depend on whether I could get past his security force to ask for his autograph or whatever now, because he's in the movie business. All right. But nevertheless, 
Or, but actually, if he if he wants to sign a thousand limited edition Leviathan pictures for Jim Cornette.com and Cornette's collectibles, maybe we could we could talk and work something out. It might be profitable for both of us. I sound like now I sound like Lauren Michaels offering the Beatles ten thousand dollars or what was the the amount of money that he offered him? I think it was like three thousand dollars. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the line was, "You guys could split it any way you want. If you want to give Ringo less, that's fine." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's up to you. We're not going to pay any attention. And the story right. is, the story allegedly is that McCartney and Lennon were actually hanging out in New York City that night. It almost went down to the studio. Well, yeah, because did they, was that just mere happenstance or had they heard on the show that, that McCartney and Lennon were in town and that instigated that and they were going to play along with it? Or was it just random chance? I think it was happenstance because I think what caused, and I could be wrong, but I think what caused the skit, what caused Lauren Michaels to do that was this was at a period of time where offers were coming in for the That's Beatles right, yeah. <laughs> and and I think there was some method of, you know, it can be cash, you know, we can do a series of peg, you know, cashier's checks, whatever it needs to be. But the, yeah, the best line was, you know, if you want to give Ringo less, we're not going to pry. All right, anyway, can I give you less? Less than I this? Really I don't know if that's give possible. give you any less, yeah, right? It wouldn't be possible, yeah, less than this. Okay, a couple people we want to recognize, uh, seriously, before we get back into the frivolity, because um, I've gone through some emails here, or tried to lately, um, and this one comes from Darren, not sure where he's from, but um, he says, I lost my mother unexpectedly on February 22nd at the age of 59, and Darren, obviously, we're sorry to hear about that. Um, yeah. But uh, he says, while not much of a wrestling fan, she loved to hear you guys one-liners and rants about the lackluster wrestling shows, which always gave her a good laugh. I thank you guys for helping me through this difficult time by doing the shows and wish you guys continued success and good health, except for Brian and his baboon liver. No, I made that well, part come up. Uh, no, Darren. Oh, well, we're sorry. And, and uh, again, you know, if, if us being frivolous on the air can help people then maybe we're doing a public service sort of like you know in, instructing people to wear their seat belts and use their left and right turn indicators um and then there's another email real quick from cat um who said i and i don't know where she's from either i used to know this area code but god damn it i can't call it now i'm a senior citizen anyway um Kat says, hello, Jim and Brian. My dad passed away this last week suddenly after having a sharp decline in his health the last six months. And the first few days were especially hard. But ironically, the segment regarding Reggie the cat and Jim being unable to make it through without cracking up made me uncontrollably smile. I appreciate you both and especially your morose humor. And also my best wishes to Reggie the cat. R.I.P. little buddy. And uh, Kat, we're sorry to hear also about your dad, but again, Reggie has become immortal. Did you see the picture we retweeted of of Reggie? Yes, we actually have, I think, two different photos of Reggie that Ryan, Reggie's owner, boss, whatever you want to call him, sent in. Parent. Parent. What what, what would you what do you think? Swami's your employee? Just hey, Swami, I'll dock you that hour's pay if you don't quit fucking chewing the carpet. He's the official mascot of Arcadian Vanguard. He is my employee. Well, he, 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 at the same time, if, you know, the poor little carpet muncher over there. <laughs> anyway, you should treat him nicer. So here's some more updates. Um, okay, you know Cornette's Collectibles is a, a multi-million dollar industry. And we're just, we've been sending merchandise out to the far corners of the earth you know, for quite some time now, but it, especially to Dave in the UK, I mailed a Cult of Cornet membership certificate to Dave over in the UK in August of 2020. And he emailed me back a couple months later. You know, of course, international mail in 2020, it was, they were having their issues. But he emailed me back a couple months later. He said, oh, I haven't got it yet. I said, hey, I'll send you another. This is before I had the feather bottoms and their ultra careful handling and tracking system. Instead of digging through all of the fucking international goddamn customs for them, I'll just send you another one. 
I sent him another one. He got it. And he wrote me back and he said, thank you. I will have you know that this past Monday, March the 13th of 2023, he emailed me back to say the first one just arrived. When did you send it? August of 2020. Wow, what the Inter hell? An international first class envelope from the United States to the United Kingdom. It's so weird. You know, I've had a few issues in the last couple of years since the pandemic where uh, 605 shirts or various merch were sent out, never arrived. We had to send it a second time. Like you said, sometimes the second package arrived before the first one. And then there have even been issues with some of the publications I read out of England, like Mojo Magazine, where the issues just never arrived. And certain things would come from England, certain things wouldn't, certain things would come months after the fact. There's still so many issues going on with the mail going across the sea. It's crazy. Well, and I'll have you know that, goddamn, that's why we got the feather bottoms on the case. Because now we can track all this shit. See, before, we were just willy-nilly leaving it up to these governments. But now, I've got a method. <laughs> why, why, why do you laugh at my method? The feather bottoms ultra, ultra careful handling system. We'll talk more about that in a second. Yes. But I, ha I have another update. You got a method that'll be um, instituted by all those meth heads over at the feather bottom... Hey, collection agency or whatever it is. I'll have, you know, Melancholia, cousin Melancholia, we talked about her on the drive through She's got the conjoined face issue she was born with. Uh, she's not allowed to, to use meth because the problem is, as I said, they've almost, they've had to resuscitate her from drowning four or five times when she started crying with all four of those eyes, you know, but goddamn also the, the four nostrils. If she could hoover up half of fucking West Virginia's mess supply. And, and so she's not allowed to do that type of thing. She's, she's on, on probation. Do not cast aspersions at cousin Mel melancholia. I certainly wouldn't. I'm glad she's working on your merch stuff. That sounds like a good move. Well, that's what we're, we're doing. We're, we're rehabbing people. We're bringing people back into society, making them productive members of, of the, the society is what we're doing. Yeah, wait until they take one of those figures of yours and turn it into a crack pipe. We'll see how into fixing society you are at that point. Hey, where would they be, where would they be sucking on? You take off the head, right, I think, and then you could use maybe wait, the body now, of the Jim Cornette figure to put your shit, and then maybe you gotta find a spot to light, and then you'd smoke it out of the head of the figure, I think. Well, but seems like they'd have to poke some extra holes in me somewhere, and that would just be weird. Well, I think they just removed the head and used the torso as the chamber i got another email <laughs> and this i'm on drugs bring, <laughs> bring some clarity to the situation here this is from scott from utah uh he, hello corny and brian i wanted to bring some clarity to the bray wyatt storyline he is trying to create something called analog horror See, we've been talking about that this none of this makes any sense, and how do, how is he even pitching it to the writers or the people who put the videos together, or who's coming up with it if he ain't, and what, how do they make the people that are airing it understand it, much less the viewer? And uh, Scott continues, these videos, the analog horror, do not tell stories the usual way. Well, you got that right but instead will use fake newscasts, educational videos, and other types of old media to tell the story. To get the whole story, you must put it together like a puzzle. You have to put pieces, or have to have, or I think he's, this is typed and he's uh, eliminated a word, but you have to put pieces from each segment and put them together. The problem is this kind of entertainment is the most niche thing you could make. Most people will not have the time or even want to solve the story. Most will instead ignore it. And this is assuming he even has a story. He could just be throwing spooky images on the screen. So is this, is it's analog horror? Is this, does this come from Japan also? 
I don't know, because I mean, it like reminds, the anime. Well, the first thing I thought about it was actually a Japanese movie, Ringu, which became the Ring here in America with Naomi Watts. When I first started seeing all the Bray Wyatt stuff a while ago, but you know, it's like anything with wrestling. I think you kind of need an you need to figure out the end sometimes to get there. It seems <laughs> like with all the Bray Wyatt stuff, it's just here's a bunch of stuff. It never goes anywhere. There's never a conclusion. There's never anything that makes sense. It's just kind of a sloppy excuse like oh we're doing all this this is analog horror so we just keep doing it it never goes anywhere it never makes sense and i think and you can tell me if you think i'm wrong based on the feedback we see and everything we see i don't think people are taking the bray wyatt stuff as much now as they were when they first saw it because even the stupid stuff isn't as original as it was a couple years ago well yeah because I mean, again, we said a lot of people love the, which again was before we started paying very close attention to the program, if at all, the, you know, when he was the leader of the, the, the family, the swamps, the fucking lantern, the spooky people that you would see in, you know, the hills have eyes or, you know, the fucking, uh, the typical backwoods, Texas chainsaw massacre house family, whatever. Okay. That's cool. I'm I'm all for that. Show me some of that. Let's see what you got. But by the time that we started watching, he was he was being burned alive on pay per view and had the fucking fun house with the puppets and everything. And a lot of people then were saying, "Oh, we love him," but boy, we really loved this. The you know the Wyatt family and this and they were they were still romanticizing what he had just previously done while he was doing that shit. But now. And he's come back and he's doing this and it's even more inexplicable and the shows are moving at an even slower pace than, you know, they were a few years ago to the point where you're already kind of impatient will something fucking happen. Um, Yeah, we're seeing a lot, not just our listeners, but just people in general on whatever feedback, Twitter, social media going, Jesus Christ, will he get to the fucking point? And yes, the the some of the people in the building are you know are still depending on where they are and what venue and what's going on, what he's doing. They're they're loving it, but it it's not like a raving full throated oh my god like it might have been at one point. Yeah, and I'm not against the idea because I think it's part of where we are today as a society, the interactive nature of a lot of things. I'm not against the idea of wrestling fans having to you know pause something and find clues. But if it's nonstop that and it never goes anywhere, then it's just you're doing that for no reason. I can go put up a video with random images and in the middle of it put up the word hot dog. Like it doesn't mean <laughs> anything. And that's all this stuff is. And again, beyond all the issues with what we're talking about here, you also have the issue of anyone he works with comes out of it looking worse. It's impossible to work a program with this guy. Nothing goes anywhere. And it's going to be interesting to see how they put him back on the show when they do, assuming they will, whenever he returns, because beyond the merch, you can't tell me this run is good. Beyond whatever they're making in merch sales, this has been a disastrous run for Bray Wyatt. Well, and we don't know where he's gone here lately. Um, There was speculation, was he injured? Well, you know, nobody's seen him really do anything to get hurt. Um, you know, the creative was changed. We're blah blah blah. Maybe they're say, you know what? <laughs> Pump the brakes here a second. People are turning down working with him. It, people's it. It seems like he's a popular person socially, or you know, behind the scenes. It's not like everybody in the locker room hates him. It just nobody wants to work with that guy on screen. So maybe they're evaluating that, and how can we? Use this guy's talents. He can talk. Remember the first week or two he was back? I was like, God, this guy can talk to people. But if he just anything. makes a fucking point. He doesn't say anything. He can, he, you, he can hook him with his voice and his delivery when he's being a real person. Not when he's being um, fucking Jason Voorhees' fucking third cousin. This will go um, down as one of the best moves. Uh, uh, seriously, one of the best moves Tony Khan made was not even trying to sign this guy, not really considering it because 
this would have been even worse on AEW TV. And it's clear that Bray Wyatt is someone who wants to do his own thing. You know, I was watching recently an interview with Crispin Glover about the problems he had with Back to the Future and the producer, Robert Zemeckis, and everyone else. The actor that was going to play George McFly was like, I don't like the way this is going. It's too much about materialism and commercialism, and I think my character should do this. Eventually, you don't want the guy who just wants to do his own thing. You need someone who's going to do what's right for everyone else on the team. Not to compare Crispin Glover to Bray Wyatt. I think Crispin Glover's much more talented. <laughs> but I think that's the problem you have with Bray Wyatt now. You have a guy who, in a sense, beyond being released, has been spoiled by WWE. And they've let him run wild with all of this stuff. And it's not made anything better. And again, he doesn't have anyone to work with. It's main eventers specifically. We've seen what he did to Seth Rollins and other people. Brock Lesnar said no. We know it wouldn't have worked that well for Lashley. Who do you program with this guy? Everyone's going to come out of it the same way. It's, a, it's almost an impossible task to use him. And here's the... Th he did a lot of that stuff, the, the being the burned alive and etc., under Vince McMahon. And then when Vince was gone... Uh, that's why we were willing to say, okay, what is a new creative regime going to do? But let me ask you this, <laughs> because again, all I saw was them burning this fucking guy alive and the Firefly Funhouse and all that shit. But at least there wasn't, he didn't have alter egos and, and people from his family coming in and mysterious fashioning, dropping him on his head or whatever. The Vince McMahon I knew if he was watching the videos or he was listening to the promo, his reaction would be at the end of it, what the fuck is he talking about? What point is he making? That's the same one that, that Vince would, the Vince I knew would have had. So someone would have had to have told Vince, look, <laughs> here's the point eventually that he's going to make or that is going to be said or that this, this is going to happen. And we're just milking the people incessantly. Then it, it, he may have gone along with it then. But he would have had to have, he would have demanded to know, what the fuck is this fucking guy saying? Because I've seen him do it before on much less innoc or more innocuous, vague promos where a guy just got lost and didn't really make a point and he would, Vince would be livid. And this just meanders everywhere. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Does Bray Wyatt's comeback over the last several months remind you at all of when Vince brought back the Ultimate Warrior in 96? Whoa. Yeah, in a, in a, in a different, you know, in-ring fashion. But right. yes, I get what you're saying. But in terms of here's a guy who was a big star, and in his eyes, he understands it in a way that the promotion doesn't. Warrior came back. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to do comic books. That promo where he came out with the hat on to confront Jerry Lawler, didn't run to the yeah. ring, walked out with a hat on, the Ultimate Warrior. All of a sudden, what worked wasn't what was being done. It was more about what he had inside of him and the th words he wanted to use and the things he wanted to do. Here you have Bray Wyatt, not a big fan of his work. Early on, it was one thing. It became another thing. You have to say, in a sense, he was successful selling merch. Fans were into him. But since he's come back, it remind, I mean, I think there's a lot of comparisons to the Warriors return in 96. Well, and also um, the nostalgia factor of, boy, everybody was over the moon about it for the first few weeks, and then it started cooling yeah. off a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, then it was like, is this, is this what's going to happen? He didn't fit anymore. And it had only been, what, at that point, uh, four years. So how long did Bray stay gone? A year and a half, two years, somewhere in that range. Maybe he should have stayed gone a little longer so we'd have missed him more. I don't know. I wouldn't have missed him. Anyway, one more little brief update. Uh, this is from Jose, who doesn't give a hometown or location either. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the Jose was on the uh, email address. He, he says, hello, Jim and the great Brian last. My name is Joe and I'm from L.A. Hello, Joe, formerly known as Jose from L.A. 
But now, is that Louisiana? Because it's L.A. in capitals, or is it Los Angeles? The home to many outlaw wrestlers, he says. That could go either way. I'm writing to you because recently you were talking about why they don't bring back classic names like Gladys and Ethel. <laughs> and see, this caught my eye right away because we had this conversation. It was on the it's on the YouTube channel, so we did we did it some time back. But I've mentioned this a couple of times. The good old fashioned American names are going by the wayside. Like when my Aunt Lola and and my mother, which we'll talk about in a second here. But Old uh, Jose, a.k.a. Joe, has uh, has uh, written here a list. Um, it says a list analyzed from the Social Security Baby Names Registry showed that the top 10 names listed below have gone the way of the dinosaur, and they're not being used anymore. Would you like to hear... The top 10 list of names that are not being used anymore, according to the Social Security Baby Name Registry and Joe from L.A. Is this just female names or any names? Well, there are both on the list, but as you will see, one dominates. One gender dominates. Like the one I'm curious about is, does anyone name their child Seymour anymore? Seymour anymore? Well, Seymour. Yeah, I, I actually, he was a, he was a guy who used to work for my accountant. Seymour anymore. Then he transferred over. He was trying to get into pre-law. When was the last time you met someone named Seymour? You know what? It's been a while. And see, that this is something that maybe we're going to have to have the cult do more research. But let me get to Joe's list. You'll see what, what's going to happen here. Number 10. Pauline. Pauline is gone. No more Pauline. Okay. I can see you're all broken up about it. I like Pauline Black from The Selector, but okay, let's see who else is on the list. Yeah, there, down here in Kentucky, there was a famous, a very famous, she wrote a book in the early 70s about her days in the, the maddening business. She ran a house of ill repute. Her name was Pauline Tabor, and this was all there like the 30s, 40s, 50s, or whatever, and she spilled the beans on many of the, I think it was down in Bowling Green, spilled the beans on many of the officials and politicians and various high muckety mucks that used to come and visit her, her girls. What'd you think of the Paula chant for Paul Orndorff? Oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> that was brilliant. Who started that? Oh, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Um, it was, he was in a program with, uh, was it, oh, God damn it. I don't even want to say now because I'll be wrong, but whoever he was in a program with got that gun. He milked that like a prize cow. Anyway, number nine. You would never think this. Marjorie. Nobody wants to be named Marjorie anymore. Marge, for short. Well, now, sometimes it could just be Marge. It didn't have to be Marjorie. Is that true? Are there people just named what? Marge? Like, that's their actual name that's not short for Marjorie? Well, I... Yeah! Yeah, it is. That's true. All or right. as you know... Marge shot, Large Marge. I'm trying to think of other Marges. Large Marge, she was in charge. <laughs> but no, but here now, we're getting to number eight, and I'm pissed about this. Thelma! My mother's name was Thelma. Mama Cornette, that was her name. They're not using it anymore. They probably retired it in her honor. Are you surprised about that, considering how popular Thelma and Louise was, that that wouldn't have... Because usually when there's like a big thing in pop culture, it causes people to start naming their kids like after Game of Thrones characters and stuff. Are you surprised that Thelma went that way? Well, how long has it been since Thelma and Louise went over the cliff? Uh, that was in the early 90s. Well, see, 30 years. <laughs> yeah. All, the, all those Thelmas are grandmothers now. Number seven, Ralph. The, the only, I'll, I'll tip you off, the only male name on this list is Ralph. Wow, that's interesting. But apparently, no that's scene. another of Jericho's ideas that people just say, well, we won't even fucking call children anything close to this guy anymore. It's been 30 years there, too. People still remember it. You talking about Ralphus? Ralphus. 
See, another guy Jericho was going to make a big star. Well, Jericho, I mean, to give Jericho credit, Jericho got Ralphus really over, and it's probably the smartest thing he did was not taking Ralphus with him to WWE. Oh, good Lord. Because there were people that wanted that. Do you remember? There were fans upset that he did not have Ralphus with him when he went to WWE. It was just a rib. He saw this ludicrous looking human being on the <laughs> ring crew and said, I've got to get this fucking face on television. No, I, I'm just fucking, but that was actually a good thing. But not that he would take him to the W. Anyway, number six, mentioned it before, Ethel. No more Ethel. What, Ethel Barrymore, right? A classic name of the American theater. Ethel no Kennedy. more. Ethel Kennedy. Number five, along those same lines, Edna. No more Ednas. I guess it's been over a hundred years since Edna Purviance was the darling of the silent screen. I wonder about Ed. I wonder for the male version if Ed is still used. Well, certainly not as much oh, as it yes. once was, but well, you think it is? but you got you got you got Edward, you got Eddie, you got Ted. You got all kinds of variations. Plus, it, it's it's Edward. Uh, it's a it's a fucking king from England and a saint too, isn't it? So you got all those people going for you. Number four, Gladys. Are you glad about Gladys? I'm not surprised. Well, now Gladys. I mean, come on, Gladys Kravitz. The next door neighbor to the Stevenses on Bewitched. She was a, a a fine young lady that you would want to name your children after. Gladys Knight, a big star, still out there today, still active. I don't know where the pips are, but again, I'm she, not surprised. She's still there on the midnight train to Georgia, but they're in, in uh, coach. She's in first class. <laughs> I'm not surprised that that name is not really being used as much. I don't think it's as bad as some of the other ones like Ethel or Edna. Uh, now, bad, now you're insulting a certain uh, segment of the listenership. I want all the Ethels and Ednas that are listening today to write in and try to get Brian last canceled. I don't need any more death threats. Come on, Edna and uh, everyone else. Leave me alone. Number three. Big surprise here. Doris. You're surprised by that? Doris Day. K sera, sera. I guess what will be will be. Doris has been canceled. That's what they say about it. Que sera, sera. And number two, who we were just talking about the Archies, Betty. How can Betty, not the the classic all American blonde high school girl's name? Well, there's good old Betty. No more. I can see you're broke up about that as well. And the number one name that will on this list that will never be referred to again. Mildred. No more Mildred. Mildred Burke will be a forgotten name in the world. Well, Who she else? Won't, it won't be a forgotten another, name, but people won't be named after her. Well, see, there won't be people to carry her name on. I understand that, that Burke is going to be outlawed also. See, Mildred, you could shorten to Millie. And I only know that because Mike Leno once put out an article where he referred to Mildred Burke as Millie Burke, and I thought it was oh, the funniest God. thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Millie Burke. Millie Burke, baby. If Millie Burke had only married Willie Apter. No more Mildred. And you know what? Not, what is not on the list, and I still have high hopes for, one of my first grade teachers' first names, Myrtle. Myrtle was not on this list. Maybe Myrtle can make a comeback. No way. Unless there's a TV right. show with a very popular Myrtle, there's no way. A very popular, well, maybe Crepe Myrtle will make a comeback. All right, speaking of making a comeback from that bit and from obscurity comes the big spring spectacular sale at jimcornett.com and Cornette's Collectibles. People have been offended that I have not brought new merchandise into the world, procreated as it, as it is, as it will be as you might say. And so we're bringing three brand new items to market on Saturday, April the 8th at noon Eastern. All this stuff goes on sale at jimcornett.com. We've mentioned it. I will run through it briefly and bring up what I talked about on the drive through First of all, the Inside the Ropes magazine 
the December 2022 issue with me on the cover that was all a flutter on Twitter and the highest selling issue in the history of the magazine. We are going to have a limited uh, run of 1,000 copies available at jimcornett.com. They can be personally autographed to your specifications, and you can save uh, international shipping from the UK on that. Well, I'm actually, you can't get it from the UK autographed because I'm not in the UK. So you can only get it here autographed. Also, by special arrangement with good old Kenny McIntosh and all the Inside the Ropes gang, the live event that we did in London uh, on uh, October the 5th, 2016, Kenny hosted myself and Jim Ross in a panel discussion on the rise of the Attitude Era, and Brett the Hitman Hart jumped in on that. Uh, Jim Cornette not dot com. Did <laughs> Jim Cornette not come? They'd like it if that was the case. Jim dot com will be the exclusive distributor of this fine DVD, and that will come autographed by me as well. And here's what we need some help on because the Breast Cancer Pink and Black, Jim Cornette official action figure will also go on sale. I told the story of how that Stace had had the idea from her breast cancer license plate and, and et cetera, and we had, obviously it's been a couple years because the lead time on these things, we've got it now. And when I Google-fied, because we want to give money to breast cancer. When I Google-fied breast cancer charity, up pops Susan G. Komen. And they've got a, a, a big name, and they've uh, the, the, the ribbons and the advertising and everything. I thought, well, this is good. And I'm not saying it's not. But then we had, over the last few days since I had announced this, we had a nurse, we had several other people saying, oh, no they spend too much money on merchandising or on their marketing and you should give it to the American Cancer Society. And on their then executives. You, well, and on their executives. And then you mentioned City of Hope and I just saw an email this morning that somebody seconded your emotion. So, folks, the point is, it is an official Jim Cornette action figure from Figures Toy Company and it's in breast cancer pink and black with a pink tennis racket cover. And comes with a microphone, the glasses, the whole nine yards. There will be a thousand of them that will go on sale on Saturday, April 8th at noon Eastern at jimcornette.com. And we know how these, these things go fairly quickly. These will not be remade. This is a limited edition. We're going to give $10 per each figure sold to breast cancer charity of some form. And obviously, the goal is to raise $10,000. So. The question is, since you guys, the cult of Cornet, are involved in this also, where do you guys think that I should best apply this money that we are raising to breast cancer or potentially any form of cancer? Uh, the contenders are Sujin. Su Sujin. Sujin. That's another name you don't see on That's the That's another anymore. name that you don't see. You don't see those people <laughs> named there anymore. And... Blah! There's another name you don't see come up. Susan. Susan G. Komen, which now we've we've had a few strikes against, or the American Cancer Society, or the City of Hope. And in the next few days, so we can get this nailed down. The on sale is not till April the eighth. We got time. I got to make Hotchkiss change the banner on the website. But uh, if you will email me, if you have some knowledge of this. If you, I don't want everybody just email and vote. Like, yeah, I don't know anything about any of this, but I like the name, sound of that name. If you have some learned opinion on this and you'd like to weigh in, Jim Cornette at jimcornette.com, the email address, put breast cancer in the subject matter, sub, or subject line. And over the next few days after you hear this, we're going to make a decision based on the feedback we get from the cult of Cornette. And also, as I mentioned, because of the potential for abuse in these things, uh, then as soon as we do make that donation, Hotchkiss will be uh, tweeting out the confirmation thingy that we get or whatever the fuck. You know, I'm, I'm removed from the paperwork these days. I let them do the electronic shit. But anyway, that's all going to happen starting Saturday, April 8th at noon 
Eastern time. And uh, is, and we will get this uh, the donation nailed down. And those figures usually go quick. So jump in, folks, uh, as soon as you can. Oh, me. Uh, where's my shit now? Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. Because I got another email on what we've been talking about again, Brian. The AEW video game. From Apparently, we have a lot of people in our audience that I'm not talking about just that play video, but that know some background on how they are made, marketed, interested bystanders, whatever the case. Because this is another guy. Well, he worked as a journalist, he says, in the video game sector. Uh, his name is Clark Peterson from Passaic, New Jersey. And his email begins, please keep my name redacted if this is read on air. Why would oh. you just say it? Oh, uh, well, sorry, Clark. But no, 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 that's not his name. I'm being a smart ass. Okay. I, I just don't like Clark Peterson from Passaic, New Jersey. I don't know how many Clarks there are in Passaic, but anyway. Well, now, see, is that another endangered name? All right, let's get to start, start of this email here and get into this thing. I have worked as a journalist in the video game sector some years ago and would like to give you both a little more insight into why the upcoming AEW video game is shaping up to be a mess. First of all, let's talk about the biggest warning sign, the release date. Sports titles typically run a yearly release schedule. While this allows the developers to add new gameplay features and keep things fresh, the main reason for an annual release is to keep the rosters and branding up to date. This is particularly important for wrestling games due to hirings, firings, face-heel alignments, and gimmick changes. Despite their best efforts, the WWE games are often outdated upon release due to roster and presentation changes. Especially when Vince was around, probably. I can imagine they, you know, when they would turn on a dime. You may think that the AEW game is protected from this somewhat, as they have not yet begun a yearly schedule, but this is not the case. The AEW game has been in the oven so long that will it will include both Cody Rhodes and CM Punk. So I guess, I guess Brian, before I go on with this, so when they build this thing, they can't just, if somebody quits, they can't just say, oh, okay, unplug him, take him out. It fucks the whole deal up, right? Well, I mean, they, technically they could, but... I don't know how much it would fuck up the deal or not, but if they've been working on, let's say, a Cody Rhodes character for the game since 2020, at this point you're going to... I mean, it, the whole... Everything with the game is all messed up. I mean... Okay, well, scheduling. back to the email. While I'm sure you will agree that this is a positive for the game, having Cody and CM Punk, please try to imagine those two names as a date stamp on the roster. Lord knows how outdated this thing is going to be when it finally hits shelves. The knock-on effect of this outdated roster and branding, the current Dynamite presentation will not make it to the game because when they changed producers here a few months ago, comes in the form of post-release content. As Brian explained on the latest experience, but this email is a week or two old, games can be expanded with downloadable content, giving the customer more things to do at an additional cost. If customers who buy the AEW game feel like they need to buy too many extra wrestlers just to make it resemble the current product, it could cause a lot of backlash from even the most loyal of fans. Finally, let's talk about false advertising. While games are always subject to change between builds or versions, uh, for example, the Big Show being removed from games in the year 2000 when he was sent to OVW, the changes to violence in AEW Fight Forever may be too drastic for fans to accept. Now, y'all, my God, the changes to the violence in the video game. Oh, my God. Now, sure, fans won't have a legal leg to stand on, but as it stands, the game is still being advertised as being incredibly gory. Why does it have to be incredibly? Is it just gory? Close enough for rock and roll? Uh, he said, despite Omega discussing the censorship changes that have been made on a podcast, the advertising has not been updated to reflect this. Therefore, many fans will still buy this game, expecting to see the same levels of bloodshed currently depicted in promotional photos and footage. So, oh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, first, it, it, this is the last line, and here I want to bring this up because first impressions are more important than ever. The TNA Impact game lacked many features that the WWE titles had included for years, and as a result, no other major TNA games were made. Uh, even WWE is not immune to failure, they say, or uh, he says anonymous, that is. With their 2020 release being so irreparably broken that it forced them to skip the 2021 release altogether and attempt to recover. Holy shit. So if AEW botched their video game debut, they run the risk of killing any future sequels before they're even a twinkle in Twinkle Toes' eye. And I remember... This was obviously I was with TNA between 2006 and 2009. And at some point before I was finished with them, possibly later in that time period, they had me stay over in Orlando one morning to go and be fitted with the stuff where they take the readings on your movements for the, the mo not motion capture. I wasn't doing the goddamn moves in the ring, but like the capture of me, they scanned me to have me in a video game. You know what I'm trying to say here, Brian? Motion capture, yeah. Well, it wasn't necessarily, it was also, they were scared what I looked like and just having me do some pointing and things, but it's not like I was doing the wrestling moves or whatever, but they scanned me to be in the next game, <laughs> which was never made. And this is, more than 15 years ago, so you can imagine how dick all of I knew or gave a shit about video games. And I knew that, I knew you could make a lot of money on being in the WWE one, and I knew that there was nobody making any fucking merchandise money in TNA whatsoever, so I was just grumpy about having to stay and not be able to drive home quicker. But uh, I guess apparently they the first game was, shockingly, for TNA, not up to snuff, as Aunt Lola used to say, and they never made another one. So, but at least they got it out. They didn't call it Take Forever. It's been a disaster, I think. And, you know, we don't know what the end result will be, but they started, they announced it, I think, in 2019. So they've at least been working on it since 2020. It's going to be almost four years soon. There's no release game. We still see images or clips of how gameplay would be but it's not finalized the roster's an issue like you said cody rhodes is in the new wwe game he's also going to be in this game that they started working on years ago cm punk <laughs> was originally on the cover of this thing now kenny omega's in that spot but punk is oh, supposed to be in this joy. game wwe you know their thing is now something that some fans of those games look forward to i'm not a fan of those but like baseball Every year, Major League Baseball puts out a new version of MLB The Show for the new season. Updated rosters, players who retired, sometimes they add legends, add various different things, but every year, there's a new version of that game. With the AEW game, we still don't have an original version, and they're still playing around with every single end of it. The roster is going to be an issue, and, you know, I just think... People who want to say that Kenny Omega, because he's a fan of video games, that somehow gave him a leg up on this, I think that we'll probably learn a lot more about how badly he's bungled many things with this, specifically including the direct communication with talent, because I've seen his text messages about this game and his conduct as the supervisor of this game. There is nothing that looks positive yet about this. It seems like it's just a giant money pit that is going nowhere. When they release this game, is it going to make the money back? Or are they going to be in a position where they can release the game and then a year later put out an updated roster? Is it just going to be you have to download all the talent individually going forward because none of them were there when the game was put together? Again, unless they turn around and turn this into a major, major source of profit, the video game has been a disaster and a waste of time and a waste of company money and nothing has got off the ground. It's gotten to the point where it's a laughing stock. No one's even seen it. So 
again, it could debut and maybe non-wrestling fans will hear about this game and how wacky and gory and fun it is and flock to it. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, though. But now, well, here's a question. Do and AEW isn't now? as hot now as it was in 2019 or 2020. Nothing is pointing up for the video game, I don't think. Do they need to start now on making the second version because they're going to have to change so much of the talent from the first version to the second version? They probably need to get a head start on that, don't they? Is Miro in the game? Is Andrade I, what, in the game? Oh, I mean, you I'm, mean you mean the video game? I don't yeah. know whether he's in the fucking game or not. And I, Andrade's sitting home, not beating up Sammy Guevara. Maybe that can be a, that can be when you hit the goddamn high level, or you downloadable your content. That's when fucking Andre pops up on the screen and beats the shit out of Sammy Guevara. They didn't even have a company off the ground yet, and they ran right to this video game. And here we are years later, they have had successful pay-per-views, they've had million-dollar gates, there's no progress on the video game. And here's the thing, and I will not beat the dead horse too much further, but he's, oh, well, he's played so many of those video games, and he's read up on it, and he's interacted with other people who like to play video games. I think we've established, I have driven somewhere in my life around 2 million miles. I got 300,000 miles on the current vehicle sitting out in the driveway. If you asked me, <laughs> take that goddamn engine out of that thing and put it back in, fuck you. That's a whole different fucking level of involvement. And I don't believe we've heard of, of Kenny going to goddamn computer school for fucking building video games. Just, just, twiddling his joystick but that's the other thing and again taking any of your personal feelings about omega out of it we have not heard a single positive thing about his work on the video game from people that we've spoken to who would be of the know or in the know i guess we should say like nothing of the know or in the now he's there and he's involved but kenny omega if you're the biggest fan of kenny omega you have to accept this because it's true kenny omega if you think he's the most talented guy in the ring that's fine he is incompetent as an executive and he's incompetent when it comes to dealing with talent and he's of in general a fringe mindset so that dave Meltzer can give him seven and a half stars and love his match readers of the observer will love his stuff there's a segment of the AEW audience that will there's a larger audience that don't and when you see the ratings every week and you see the reaction to them that's part of it. So to tie it back to the video game, you have a guy who loves playing video games, but maybe he doesn't love video games the way everyone else does. <laughs> maybe it's just he's a unique person and his <laughs> unique way of thinking about things is so fringe that it doesn't necessarily correlate towards bigger ideas for the big idea. You have just made the phrase a unique person hilarious to me because... I don't know why. Maybe it's the way you applied it. I'm trying to be but, nice. You know, I'm trying to be fair because everyone thinks if we say anything about Omega that's not positive, we're just killing him. I'm really trying to like, as someone who knows a little bit about what I'm talking about here and has seen a lot about what I'm talking about here, the fact is he is not competent outside of the ring at any of these things. And whether he's competent in the ring, again, that's in the eye of the beholder. I'm not going to get into that argument here, but the idea that Tony Khan, with all this money and his lifelong dream, was going to start a video game division and put Kenny Omega anywhere near the leadership of that division, it should surprise no one that there's been no progress and we are today where we are. You know where we are right now, Brian Last, as far as, as, far as Twinkle Toes is concerned? He's doing great. He's doing wonderful. Things are on the up and up. His future's so bright. He's got to wear him some shades. Oh. And you know what, <laughs> Brian, that's exactly the same way I feel about our program and, and the cult of Cornette should too out there. Our future is so bright, we got to wear shades. And right now, I can tell you how, if you wear a pair of shades and then you get them broken for some reason, such as you, I don't know, you get hit by a car, run over by a bread truck, 
fall off a cliff, into a chasm or a precipice, whatever the heck, it doesn't matter what goes. Let's say that somebody just hauls off and hits you in the head with a large stick and breaks your sunglasses. That don't matter because you're going to have two pair. And it's all thanks to our friends at Shady Rays. That's why I mentioned Melancholia, the feather bottoms cousin the other day, because this is the perfect deal for her with that conjoined face situation. She's got four eyes, so she needs four lenses. Well, what, what, you, what you got going on here? You're covered with Shady Ray no matter which way you turn, so to speak. Because, first of all, the Shady Rays are durable to begin with, and it's hard to break them. Even if you try, we don't encourage you to let a safe fall on your head, but if you're walking down a city street, anything could happen. The Shady Rays have polarized lenses. You get crystal clear vision, strong sun protection. But every pair of Shady Rays is backed by their industry-leading lost and broken replacements program. If you break or lose your pair, the second you take them out of the box or whenever, they will send you a replacement pair for free. That's a great deal. That is a great deal. Lost and broken replacements. Now, let's, let's say that you somehow, you're, you yourself are replaced and you're lost and broken. You're wandering the streets. <laughs> They're not going to replace you, but they'll replace your fucking sunglasses because they're not happy unless you're happy. What kind of example is that to you? I'm saying right. if, you get, if you get replaced in your job, if you get replaced in your marriage or your love affair or whatever, you're just going to be a walking around moping motherfucker. But if you break your sunglasses, then, then they'll replace those free just like that. And they're not happy unless you're happy. So you need to be happy. They'll give you 30 days to try these out. If you don't like them, you could exchange or return them for free. That's amazing right there. And the Shady Rays Impact Program works with nonprofits worldwide to make an impact on the lives of children and young adults. They build play sets for pediatric cancer patients. They create adventures for young adults with MS. Well. Fuck, I don't even want them to send me the sunglasses. I just want to send them the money. These are some good people. That's right. But get the sunglasses because they're worth it and they're great. Well, especially if you're going to go out in the sun. Well, then you got to do something. As a matter of fact, I'd get numerous pairs and put them all over your body because the fucking sun causes what? skin cancer. You never know what's going to happen when you're, you're exposing parts of your body. Just cover yourself well, in shady rays. Let's just make sure we specify. Sort of like ladies. a hazmat outfit. Well, no, it won't work like that. If you put sunglasses all over your body, it will not do anything to protect your body. So let's not go with that as a suggestion or as something that would actually help any of the listeners. All right. Don't go out in the sun, people. Just stay away from the sun. Well, I didn't get say the that. Sun well, no, get the sunglasses, wear them indoors, because these, who knows what these LED lights are doing to us. People, they can change your brain waves. I was reading this thing the other day. It said that if you're exposed to LED lights, it could cause paranoia and pandemonium. So get sunglasses from Shady Rays and wear them inside the house. Stay out of the sunlight. Don't get skin cancer. And if you break them, they'll replace them for free. But now listen to this. If you go to ShadyRays.com, that's S-H-A-D-Y-R-A-Y-S, Shady Rays, how else would you spell it, dot com slash J-C-E, and use the code J-C-E, you will get a second pair of Shady Rays for free when you buy one pair. And you don't have to break the first pair before you get the second pair. So you're going to get two pair for the price of one, and then... Apparently, either one of those that you break, well, you could get more. So, hell, if you're accident prone, you could retire on this. That's shadyrays.com slash JCE and the code JCE to get the second pair of free Shady Rays. Ain't nothing shady about that, and there ain't nothing shaking here but the leaves on the trees. So buy Shady Rays for your eye comfort. Well, I don't know how bright the future is for AEW with more television programs like this last Wednesdays. Let's uh, let's get to their segment of the program before we talk about the WWE, which may have produced the program of the week uh, Friday night. But anyway, um, God almighty, 
If you liked something on this Wednesday night's AEW, you got some of it. And if you didn't like something, you got plenty of that too. And what did you, let me, let, let me let you start because you're the person experienced in the, in the bar mitzvahs. I will defer to your experience. I, I loved the, I loved the MJF cocky, dressed up, smart ass, borscht belt insult comment, pissing all over, you know, uh, Winnipeg, uh, uh, fucking not the screaming mad, red faced, wanting to kill everybody, MJF. I love the smart ass, but what is, is there significance to the chair and the people spitting him with the chair and the I got lost. Well that is something we do at bar mitzvahs, yes. And obviously you know that is done. Been to bar mitzvahs, you wouldn't know that. But I've never been, I've never been to a Christian mitzvah either. I don't know what I don't know what they do either. I don't I think just they had do that. Birthdays. I don't I think just they had, do that. I had cake. I don't fucking know. But let me just say to start because I've seen a lot of pictures in the last week of MJF's bar mitzvah and different dancers and people said, wow, look at this. Hey, I had dancers too. And I'm also the only Jewish kid I know of that had a square off with a Nazi wrestler at his bar mitzvah. So I am still <laughs> the wrestling bar mitzvah champion of all time, period. No, because you suffered the eternal shame of <laughs> your parents wanting to do you a favor and not having any concept of who the personalities in wrestling were and weren't. And you ended up with shit stain. I've got the best story. I've got the best story. Shitstein showed up with a Nazi wrestler at a bar mitzvah. A Jewish kid at a showdown with a Nazi wrestler. I'm the greatest of all time. Let's talk about this segment. You know, there's a lot to talk about here. I will say, early on, I was a little conflicted with it because, and MJF, I think, did a good job and made me feel a little bit more at ease. There's been such a spike in anti Semitism. Just recently. I mean, it's never gone away. It's always there. But recently, it's gotten bad. So as a Jewish man, I worry sometimes when you have a heel using Judaism possibly as a heat mechanism. Because I think that could backfire. Qu I mean, they were in Canada. If they were in Alabama or Tennessee, I don't know if this would have gone over the same way. Um, I, I get what, what is the Jewish population of Canada? I don't know, but I'm sure it's more than the, probably in the South, if I had to guess. I don't know about Winnipeg versus Toronto or anything, but, you know, there's plenty of Jewish people up there. But that was the only thing that gave me a I little bit I thought they of, were all pescatarians in Canada. But that's the thing that gave me a little bit of pause, was the idea of putting some of that out there, because I think right now it's a little dangerous. Right now, you know, it's not, I don't want him to be a heel because he's Jewish. Well, no, but uh, it, it, let me ask you this then. Did you take it? Is it almost like the the I don't know Jewish version of the uh, inside promo where if you know you know it if you don't is he Archie bunkering this with the you know what he said oh we're the chosen people you know come on is that for equal response from the people who are with it and laughing because it's a quick line but for the people who are anti-semitic are you motherfucker is it one of those double double whammies i don't know see i think the way he delivered that line actually worked and that was one of the things that put well me no that's what i'm saying does yeah. it work for for you know he's he's archie bunkering it and making fun of the 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 prejudice whatever yeah. it may be i mean i got nervous just the idea of using the bar mitzvah as a segment which i assumed would be a segment that would you know, I didn't know in advance it would either have some kind of heat-seeking moment or something would happen there. It does make me nervous. Again, we're in a very interesting time right now in world history and here in America with anti-Semitism. But with that said, I actually was put at ease by it. From what I understand, because I asked around, the people in the ring with MJF were actual members of the Winnipeg Jewish community. So they actually went out and got real people who go to shul, go to the temples, go to the synagogues, and got them involved in it. So I did like that. Well, see, now you've spoiled it for me because I thought it was the fucking group of nerds that he used to really hang around with when he was a teenager. They wouldn't fly. Well, Tony would fly them to Canada. I was about to say, they wouldn't fly all the people to Canada. Money yes, is no object. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I got eight nerds. Come on, give me eight nerds from New York. And I thought that was really cool. And 
the fact that the room reacted the way they did to the, I guess we'll call it the bar mitzvah celebration, the going in a circle and lifting them up in a chair, which is part of the tradition, that was kind of cool. And the issues I, I thought I may have, they kind of were put away right away. I thought MJF was fantastic in this. I don't know how much you want me to go into the whole thing right now, just my initial thoughts, or what are you looking for here? Um, well, I mean, what are you looking for? I'm looking for you to get off those drugs is what I'm looking to get, get my fucking calm co-host back. What are you looking for here? Like Kramer when he was on the fucking coffee. Here's my, as a completely non-religious person and beholden to no uh, particular persuasion either way, my critique of this was that there's people involved in it that didn't need to be because they had, they had something here and they cluttered it up. As I said, I love MJF, the stuck-up prick MJF, the wisecracking, the I'm better than you and you know it, the fucking quick guy, the, you know, good-looking Don Rickles, however you want to fucking say it. He's in charge of the room. He's, ta he's got the models. They're kissing him on the cheek. He's making out with one. He's not admitting his shortcomings in life to the people so they can laugh at him, take heat off himself. He's not acting like someone has pushed him to the goddamn brink of insanity so mad, right? Because that's yeah. when he loses control and gives it to the people. This was the best I think we've seen from MJF on the mic and in terms of presence in a while, because he didn't show weakness. And even with the guys in the ring, he didn't let anything go. He would hit them back with lines. There was no running away right. MJF here. But he, sh he showed weakness in the way he should have, which was when they, and I'll, I'll reveal this before we get into the start of it, when he popped the hat and the glasses off and the fucking black and swollen eyes from that chain match, yeah. as, they, as they used to say when I got into business, well, it's good for the business, kid. It's good for people to see that. And that was a place, and when Darby Allen, which we'll get to in a second, hit him with the, geez, Max, you look like shit. That was fucking great. But here's the problem. So MJF is, comes down. He does the whole uh, bar mitzvah celebration. And he's basically saying, I'm the best. And there's nobody in my caliber. And all of a sudden, Jungle Boy music. And here comes Jungle Boy. And he strolls down looking like Marco Stunt's homeless older brother. And then before anything happens, there's Sammy Guevara music. And he comes down looking like Sammy Guevara. And then Darby <laughs> Allen music. And here he comes. And did you hear the dead? They popped for the other guys. They popped for Jungle Boy. They mixed for Sammy because he's a heel. Darby got the response. And when he came down, he looks like somebody, even though he's the smallest one of the bunch. And one of them got in each corner, MJF's in one, the other three. And he said, oh, God, well, what do you want? And they all at the same time say, I want a title match, which was cute. But Jungle Boy does his promo. And for him, it was great. But I think the jury is in and he can't do a money promo with any feeling whatsoever. He has no he feeling has, in anything he does. I mean, that's the no. big takeaway. He has a great hairdo. And he's got a great name, but he never shows any passion in anything. He's reading off the screen in his mind these heartfelt words that he's uttering. It's good material, but he ain't he ain't there. It's like it's like listening to one of those animatronic yes, we will do that. So anyway, he's he's where he's gonna stay. And Sammy. I don't think anybody can argue is not in his current presentation or the way he's been presented over the last several months in the singles world title picture. They're doing this because that's the four pillars, right? Yeah. That Tony and his most intimate circle of nerd fans decided we're going to be the four guys that were the future of this company three years ago. Well, can and I, uh, go ahead. Uh, just I want to stop. We'll keep going about all of this, but I want to specifically talk about Sammy because I actually thought for me, one of the big takeaways here was I thought Darby was great because Darby has a very interesting, he's an interesting guy and he has an interesting way of talking. People react to it. Sammy and MJF to me was the energy because we never get to see Sammy like this. Sammy has been, and he basically said it here. A lot of what they were saying 
you know, it's kind of that line of say what's real, but don't go all the way. Yeah. He has been the job guy for the Jericho Association. He has been Jericho's bump guy. And yeah. Sammy showed more here than he has in anything he's done in as long as I could remember, because he was on his own and he was confronting another young wrestler. I really like the stuff with Sammy here. And to me, that pointed to how badly Sammy's probably been misused. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Because Sammy did a good job here, but the picture is muddled and all over the page. Yeah. Um, because he's been, and he's d did say that, tell the truth. He's been presented as the Jericho job guy and a blah, blah, blah. And he has, but also Sammy's presentation at the first, the people started loving him because he was a baby face and he did all the high risk, you know, shit. Then they started finding out that he was really kind of a dick and they got mad at him. Well, then he, cause he's got the slappable face. Then he was a good heel, but he was in the group where he wasn't the top guy. And then in this promo, he's doing a great baby face promo, even though he's been presented as a shit fucking heel for the, all this time. But then he remembered in this promo to still say, but you people in Canada still suck, boo. But yeah, that was right <laughs> after he had basically done a baby face promo there. Yes. So the, that's what I'm saying. Nobody looks at him right now as a serious challenger for the world title because of the way he's been presented. He's been a baby face. He's been a heel. He's been the flunky. The people have liked him, and then they've kind of not liked him because of he left his girlfriend, whatever the fuck. And this was a baby face and heel promo at the same time, even though it was a, it was a well-recited modern promo about how hard he worked on the indies. He does, he, we, we know he can talk when you give him something. And if you could calm him down and he'd take direction, he can work too. So they ought to take this meaning him doing a good promo as to mean we ought to seriously sit down, repackage and rehabilitate him and start pushing him. And maybe in six months, he might deserve to be in the ring with the world champion talking about wanting a, a title match. That's it's the problem of the presentation has been all over the fucking page. And that's why I said that there was too many people in this because the magic they got was <laughs> Darby Allen, Mr. Monotone, Dr. Dullard, goofy jump over the fucking moon guy suddenly just jumps up and cuts the best promo on the fucking show. How great was the line where he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to go whine on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was great here. Just, but no, he laid the whole thing out. He aligned himself with AEW and the fans, made himself one of them, talked about the other guys who just want to whine on Twitter about their push. Well, I'm damn happy to be here and I'm I want to be here. I dropped out of film school and they wanted me to change my movie. And now I came here because I'm not going to change a goddamn. He's telling them ever the people, the fans, everything they want to hear. He's making himself the underdog. One of them. One of the other things he's doing is he's one of the very few people on the mic on this show recently. That's actually putting over AEW. I wanted yes. to be here because they were going to treat me well. Everyone else is. I wish I could have gone somewhere else. I'm going to go somewhere else. With him, it was putting over the company. And, but he delivered, and he got to people with him, and he had fired up, and he showed emotion. What they ought to have done in hindsight, and I know that it, it surprised me, Darby Allen did not, you know, it was not on my bingo card or whatever, as they say, to cut the great babyface promo of the show. But they should have, in hindsight, had MJF out there and had Darby be the one to come straight out and just cut to the meat of the matter, because you might have some money there. With the way that they interacted, with the way that he got to people behind him, Jungle Boy is blah, Sammy's a heel, so, and it's it, it, he's not ready anyway. Darby fired up for himself and rose to the occasion here. And that's when... <laughs> 
MJF had pulled the hat and glasses off and then realized that he had revealed his beat up face and tried to put them back on and told them all to get the, you know, fuck out of it. Didn't say fuck, obviously, after what he said here in a minute, but tells him get out of his ring so he can have his cake. Thank you. Screw you. Bye. Moxley says fuck indiscriminately. I'm sure he doesn't ask permission. So, but anyway, when he does that, he gets in a fight, and of course, he gets knocked down, and then Sammy starts scuffling with, I think it was Jungle Boy, whoever the fuck, but anyway, MJF gets knocked off the apron of the ring, off onto the table, threw his cake on the floor, and ends up with the cake in the face, and that was the perfect way to do that, because yes, you can humiliate the heel, and it was actually accidental the way they did it, so he wasn't like a sucker just having it done to him. But you humiliate the heel in that environment, and that just makes him want to come back and get even. I think that if all the attention had been on Darby, and he'd been the one to put him in a cake, and he'd said exactly what he did, and the other two weren't involved, you would have set up your pay-per-view main event for the next time they have a pay-per-view. I love that without the other two. I mean, there's a lot going on here. And let me just say, I like the segment and we could talk about just the overall reaction people had to the segment, but I guess not to disagree with you, although I like Sammy and I like Sammy and MJF almost as much or probably more than Darby and MJF here. It was intriguing more. These two personalities, what happens if they have a problem? But I think if you're going to, do anything with the idea you have these four pillars, which is, again, a company line. It's something they have talked about. But it's probably, right now, is probably the time to do something if you're going to. Punk's not back yet. A lot of the main eventers are tied up in trios matches. If there was ever a time to make a concerted effort to try to elevate one of these guys to get to MJF's level, because he's at another level from all of them, right now is probably the time now, I thought Darby was good. I thought Sammy was good. Jungle Boy got a big pop. I heard from people in the room that they were really listening to him. But if you listen to him, he's horrible on the mic. Yeah. He comes across as unbelievable and passionless. Like sometimes you wonder Boring. why. Is he, sometimes you wonder why is this guy in wrestling? Does he like it? You know, like when you listen to yeah. him talk. I don't get Jungle Boy at all or Jungle Man, whatever he is now. But the idea of MJF doing something with Darby is intriguing. They had an excellent match the best match of the pay-per-view, whatever it was, a year and a half ago, and nothing since. Darby, you want to talk about booking malpractice, look at the way Darby's been used over the last year. You saw the reaction he got there. He is a special performer. You wouldn't know that if you watch week in and week out because he's barely on the show. Sammy has been used horribly. Going back to the TNT title with Scorpio Sky, and then back into the Jericho group, if there's a way to do something different with those two guys, Darby and Sammy, right now, and even Jungle Boy, because if you're going to go for it, right now's the time. Right now's the time to do it. I have other thoughts about the segment, but let me hit you with that, see what you think. I just, eh, I mean, again, I think they should do something with Sammy. I think it's too early to just jump him from, you know, where he's been to, boom! I'm in the world title picture. I think there's more middle there. I think Darby's, as you said, underused lately. And if you can control him from paralyzing himself, you know, as we've talked about, what a fucking underdog. And if he can talk like that, if he channeled that and he can do that some more, I think, you know, he's the guy. Jungle Boy, I'm just, bleh. You're bleh. He's just, he's a good young middle card baby face if he's got a veteran to lead him and, and have a match that makes sense. And I'm sure the, the girls like him, but I don't see him as a top guy because he's got, like you said, it doesn't look like he wants to do, he probably wants to do the moves. He just doesn't want to actually do what everybody that got into wrestling 40 years ago wanted to do, which was fucking tell people off and make money. I don't buy anything he says on the mic. Nothing ever comes across as genuine. But I wanted to ask you about the overall segment, because I liked it. I liked it a lot. I thought this is the best MJF thing in a while. I thought we got to see him 
shine the way he should. The interplay with other people without being a coward or anything. Yes. I think this is the best we've seen from... I mean, we don't really see Darby that much, but Darby was good here. Sammy was good here. We talked about Jungle Boy. It was something. It started the show. I saw some criticism, and it was along the lines of, this was a WWE show opening. Do you think that's legitimate? Do you think that's a problem? Do you think that's... What do you think I when you I swear to God, that? I didn't even know you were going to say that, and I was going to say... At least it wasn't like fucking Raw or SmackDown where we got five minutes entrances and boring scripted fucking monologues that could have been delivered whether the other people were in the ring or not. At least everybody was talking to everybody and it got to the fucking points and they had some witty lines and it sounded like them, even if in Jungle Boy's case, him is boring. No, I don't see that like a, a WWE segment at all because... Again, this was 20 minutes, but they kept it moving. Besides the, I mean, MJF can carry the thing and the the bar mitzvah and the whole nine yards. There was Falderall there. But when they got to in the ring, everybody moved their part along and MJF jumped in in the middle to keep things going. I didn't get bored, except with Jungle Boy. And then, you know, like you said, I listened to him. as good material, just, eh, but then everybody else, no, I didn't see it like the WWE because that would have been, overly written and overly scripted and overly dramatic and wouldn't have sounded like real people arguing with each other, which this kind of did, especially with Darby. Yeah, you see, and Darby and MJF were able to go back and forth a little bit. Sammy and MJF, again, I like that energy because that was like, okay, I'm going to hit you with something about you getting engaged to women. I'm going to hit you with something about your fiance. Yeah. There was something there. You can't, you can't go back and forth with Jungle Boy because if you say something to him that you didn't go over in the back, he'll fucking he'll freeze up like he just stared at the fucking Medusa. But also, what was his argument? His argument was, you think you're such a big star, you don't even appear on Dark and Rampage. Yeah. You do whatever you want around here. And he's like, yeah, that's absolutely true. I am a bigger <laughs> star than you and everyone else here. It was a weird argument he had. Well, because, I mean, that uh, for boring people, he's representing the boring audience out there, the boring clientele. All the wrestlers in the back that bust their ass. And, you know, well, tell them to learn how to do a promo and have matches that people care about. Yeah. Anyway, um, moving along, because for once, the first match started at 25 minutes into the program on AEW. So in that way, it was like Raw, except the first segment was good. But then... We get a six-man tag team match with the BBC against Hangnail, and the original dorks are back. Pizzeria Uno and his old partner, Stu Grayson. He got signed again after this. They announced he's what? once again all elite. <laughs> he's once again going to be there and do the same shit he did before. I mean, at least he looks like an athlete instead of his fat partner. But again, what kind of... Well, there's evil Uno and Stu Grayson. That sounds like lawnmower repair and tax service. What the fuck? So, anyway, um, I couldn't take this seriously because it's indie wrestling on national television when you got Wheeler Useless and Fat Uno starting the match. And they went through a break and they did some more shit. And finally, Moxley and Hangnail got face-to-face -face and got into their fight. And then... <laughs> Behind the referee's back, and I'm talking like literally about five feet behind his back, like they couldn't see it. Useless comes from out of nowhere and hits Paige over the head with the ring bell. So I get their full heels now. They're just fucking up everybody. The BBC, that is. And hangnail sells out onto the floor, and then they three on two fat ass and stew. And finally, Moxley choked out Stu. So again, especially if they were if they're gonna sign this fucking guy back, they just beat the fucking guy that does at least look like an athlete. And if he didn't have the stupidest gimmick in the world, where his name sounds like a goddamn, you know, middle school volleyball coach, but he paints himself up like who was that fucking Braveheart or whatever. And he's partners with some fat guy with a fucking shark mask on. Presentation is rotten. 
but he's an athlete and he can do some shit. So let's choke him out the first day we sign him. And we don't beat the fat fucking guy whose man boobs look like two possums fighting in a fucking burlap sack running across the ring. And then the BBC got heat on everybody. And until little Brutus and his partner, who dat, it came out and made the save. And then the heels just left because apparently they'd gotten tired of drinking bones and eating blood. Your thoughts. Not a big fan of any of these people, but with that said, I thought Stu Grayson looked really good in there. I'm not bothered like you are by Pizza Uno being big and fat. I like having big fat people on my wrestling show. I think we need more fat people on wrestling, quite frankly. Okay, but but he's here's the problem. He's not big and fat. He's little and fat. He's not big and fat well, like fucking that's... Abdullah the Butcher or King Kong Bundy or goddamn Crusher Blackwell or Bronson Reed. He's just a fucking nondescript middle-aged, pudgy, fat fucking guy in a goofy-looking mask. Well, like I said, I don't have a problem having fat people on my wrestling show. I think we need more people who are overweight in wrestling instead of everyone just being in shape or uh, somewhat in shape. Would you Would you run from this guy? Would you run from Bronson Reed? Let's say Bronson Reed's pissed at you. He's coming towards you. Are you taking off? I'm not running from anyone. I got a machete. I'm not worried about a All single right, well, human let's, being let's on the say planet. That somehow you got caught outside with Swami and you got to protect him and you're macheteless. Which one would you think about running from first, Bronson Reed or Fat Uno? I'd run towards Uno. Okay, well, there, that's a good answer too. I think in general, though, again, they have not ended Paige and Moxley. This is a continuation <sighs> of that. I don't think you, everyone knows what we think. I don't know if the average AEW fan wants more of this. I don't know if the average AEW fan has said, give me more dark order. I don't think that's something they desire. Moxley, the AEW fans by and large do like, at least Yuta is kind of healing it up now because nothing else has been really been working with him. Well, you was, but so is Moxley too, because he puts the choke on, he chokes him out. Then he puts the choke back on. He won't let it go. The referee's trying to, they're beating each other or beating the opponents over the head with ring bells. So isn't Moxley a heel? <laughs> he is. They're cheering him. And then Claudio just means less to me today than he has at any other point in AEW. I just think they've not done anything really with him to make him stand out other than being. Remember, remember Moxley's the smiling backup. guy that, the smiling guy that came in, but uh, smiling uh, the Swissman until you pissed him off, and then he was a badass. And boy, howdy, the sky's the limit here. Until now, he's he's wishy washy. He okay, I was a baby face till Moxley decided we were going to be heels, and now I'll just beat people up like a heel, like Moxley does. See what happened is this week they had a really really hot crowd. They were in a sold-out room in Winnipeg, and, you know, Jace Nakarado was there. He told me, a hot crowd. This was a crowd that wanted wrestling. And I think because of that, if this show was, if this exact show was in another place, you probably would have seen a different reaction to this Dark Order match. People were into it a little more because of the hot crowd, but I think with or without Stu Grayson's return, people are just done with the Dark Order. It's been forever. It's been since the beginning of AEW. They've been around yes. almost as long as the video game has been worked on. <laughs> They've been on the roster, the Dark Order. So I don't when, think anyone. So wants wait, to is see this, this. going to be the standard of measurement now going forward? When we get the video game, <laughs> are we going to cut it in half and count its rings? I like to that. determine how <laughs> long it took to. <laughs> That's a good idea. We could do that, but I don't think this match did much for me. I don't think this match did much for too many other people. And again, you're coming off an opening segment with arguably, I mean, this is something that people would debate, the biggest star in the company and your world champion in an attempt to elevate three other people to another level, whether it works or not, time will tell. But to follow that up with, and I know it's the first match on the show, but I'm going to say it this way, yet another six-man tag match. The format of the show and everything they're doing with the show is they're not doing a good job of making you want to stay with the show. And I mean, we'll talk about the ratings later, but I did not like this match too much. Well, then we'll skip to the next match, which I'm sure you loved because it was your girl, Jane Cargill beating up Nicole Matthews in a stellar contest that I managed to avoid completely. But 
at the finish of it or after the finish of it, here comes Taya Valkyrie. And people had thought, oh, she's going to be the surprise Canadian challenger. And instead it was Nicole Matthews from uh, fucking Winnipeg, I guess. I don't know. But at least Taya comes out. She comes face to face with Jane. She looks great. They jaw jack a little bit. She gives Layla Gray, who's the, the stooge, the baddie now for Jane. She gives her Jane's face plant finish. I didn't understand why Jane walked out of the ring and then looked back and saw Taya Valkyrie give her her friend and stooge her own finish and was laughing at her. Didn't seem to mind. But uh, thankfully, I, I, I again, I've always been a fan from what I've seen of Taya Valkyrie shit. She got a raw deal as Frankie Monet in NXT when she was interesting there for about a month until whatever the fuck they did. She She's not one of these girls that seems like she tries to do shit she can't do. She looks great. She can talk. And, you know, and she's got some experience. So let's see how many weeks it takes them to screw this up now. To be honest with you, I don't know what this fucking win streak is for unless they think Mildred Burke's coming back from the dead. What kind of level female star do they have to sign to not come in and just beat Jane? It's, what is it, 54 and 0 or whatever, and it's been three years? It's like they have two different women's divisions. There's the women's division with Jade Cargill, and then there's everyone else. She does her own thing over here, and then everyone else is running around, bopping around, doing nothing. Uh, the match was fine for what it was. It was a squash win. I will say, Layla Gray is one of the best-looking women in all of wrestling. There's got to be a better way to use her. Because she has personality and charisma, and she's really good looking. But they use her like this. Taya Valkyrie, you know, again, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to judge her as a wrestler or anything here. We didn't see her do anything. And now she's going to be on Rampage. What a debut that is. Oh, geez, I didn't even actually hear that. But at this point, uh, you know, again, I know I'm in the minority, although it's a growing minority. Investing more money in this women's division just doesn't seem like a wise move. Nothing is working. Every segment that's part of the women's division, the only ones that you could say, you know, are different are Jade's, actually. Every segment is terrible. Well, because Jade's are only, you know, a one-minute match and pose, yeah. usually. But here, that's what I'm saying. What is the win streak for? What level of star do they have to sign to come in and just beat her? Yeah, who's going to get what? over by beating Jade? Because no, exactly. no one on the roster is the right person right now. You would agree with that, right? Yes, and, and that's why I thought, to be quite honest with you, what would have happened if she'd have been in the ring and said, there's no woman from Canada that can beat me and Taya Valkyrie's from Canada, and out she comes and she beats her. What, what, what would that have harmed business-wise for AEW or Jane Cargill? Then she'd be 54 and one. But again, Ty and then you'd have, you'd have started a program. You know who Taya Valkyrie is. I think by and large wrestling fans don't, unless you're a hardcore fan. That's the point. And you have these commentators, and we can talk about that later, who are just doing an abysmal job. For as bad as Shivani is, and Shivani is as useless as you could possibly be as a commentator on a major show, Excalibur is beyond awful. I know there's fans out there that like him because he calls all the moves. If you think Excalibur and his style of commentary is conducive to getting people to pay attention to the show, listen to the show, and not tune out the show, you're missing the point. He is as counterproductive a lead commentator as there's ever been. So now you have these goofs on commentary who have to explain how this woman, who we've never seen before on this show, who if you watch major wrestling on a national basis, you may have seen with a different name on NXT. All of a sudden, she comes out. She has an entrance. We're told, oh my God, here she is. You'll see her on Rampage. That's it. None of this made any sense. This was horrible. That's what I'm saying. And they don't have to be able, the announcers don't have to be able to get the new talent over if the new talent is allowed to get over. And that's what I'm saying. And it's the same thing that Dusty Rhodes did with the Rock and Roll Express when he brought him to, to work for Jim Crockett. Even the and and I know people 
Many of them were not alive when everybody didn't know who the Rock and Roll Express was, but the people in Louisiana had seen them and the Mid-South Territory, but the Carolinas hadn't. And the Russians, Ivan Koloff and Crusher Khrushchev and Nikita Koloff, whichever pairing of the three of them, had been dominant world tag team champions and undefeated. And the Rock and Roll come in and get a title match with them the first night they beat them. And the people went crazy. Now, of course, they had a great match for 15 minutes or whatever. But in this case, if you'd have brought Ty Valkyrie out, uh, accepted the Canadian challenge, the announcers obviously should know who she is because she's supposed to be somebody. But they were, my God, she has, has she signed with AEW? We didn't even know she was here, that kind of thing. Holy mackerel. And do a two minute flurry if that and have Taya face plant that fucking Jane Cargill one, two, three, and roll out and get her hand up on the floor and leave the ring to Jane and her baddie to bitch, and you've made a new female fucking star, and you didn't do a goddamn thing to hinder the Cargill reputation because all she's doing now every week is just beating up fucking job girls anyway. Then you might actually have of a money drawing women's match that you could put on a next pay-per-view or ratings for television or whatever with Jane and Taya in a rematch and give them more time or what <laughs> maybe that might be counterproductive but maybe Taya could get Jane through it whatever the case but make something out of it is she just going to come out and beat is it going to be 100 and oh this is not Goldberg Nobody's buying a ticket to see this. Nobody's tuning in the show to see if Jane Cargill beats Nicole Matthews this week. Yeah, no, instead they have someone show up who's never been there before and the announcers fawn over her like we're supposed to have any idea what the hell they're talking about. Oh my God, it's Taya Vagra. She's all over the world. Oh yeah, this is great. This is so great. I'm so happy to be here. It's the worst. Uh... I'm, I'm serious. The, the commentary on this show, and I hate to put Taz down because I like Taz, but I think Taz is someone that he has to be with the right people. Otherwise, it turns into too much of a goof show. But Shivani and Excalibur together are as counterproductive a lead commentary team as you could possibly have. And I know it's going to flip people out who love Excalibur. He is the single most counterproductive lead commentator, even yeah. more than Michael Cole in all of wrestling. And I think that's something AEW probably down the road should address. You need lead commentators on these shows that fans actually want to hear because we've actually been seeing more and more feedback recently from people like, oh, I watched wrestling. I watched AEW with my wife or girlfriend, whatever. I forget what the email was I saw the other day. And they immediately had a problem with the commentary. Why is he talking like that? <laughs> it's a geek. It's a geek. We've been, ask we've been asking that for four years. It's, it's, yeah, it's the geek basement audience that used to do commentary over their VHSs and later their DVDs. It's a talentless, soft geek doing the same geeky shit that he did for Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, which matters nothing to the wide world of wrestling. Well, you know what, then? Now you've got me. Brian, I'm so morose over... Taya Valkyrie's chances of coming in here and making a difference. Maybe instead of AEW, she should get out of wrestling and start a small business. Small business? Like what? Well, any kind, you know, there's, there's dozens and hundreds, even thousands of small businesses around the country that you would never hear about and never see their products if it weren't for our friends at Box of Awesome. And, and so now if, if Taya Valkyrie was to start one of these small businesses that they, the Box of Awesome people go around and they pick things and they curate collections to give to their customers. She, somebody could see Taya Valkyrie's products and they could be instantly, she could be propelled into the upper echelon of the business world. She could be right up there with, with Beyonce and, and all the, the business dealings that she does, the, the fashion lines and the perfume and, and old Paris Hilton. Didn't she have some kind of imitation stank she was selling i don't know maybe well whatever it is well if taya valkyrie made something i'm sure the people at box of awesome would love to put it in their box because that's one of the cool things folks about signing up for this unique opportunity from our friends at bespoke post 
is the monthly arrival of your box of awesome. Whatever's in the box, it's going to be awesome because you picked what you like. What you do is you go to boxofawesome.com and you take the quiz because they want to know what you're interested in. And then you get suggestions and you come up with boxes. I mean, they've got incredible. I got the weekender, right? The incredible travel bag with the metal hardware, the reinforced frame, the quality leather handles and straps. It's fashioned after an old stonemason's tool bag. And I'm, I'm carrying my, my tool bags in it. And they've got knives. They've got barbecue rubs. They've got hot sauces. They've got all kinds of items for all kinds of interests. And when you get this box, each box valued at around $70, you pay a fraction of that, a minute portion, a little sliver, just a drava, and you're supporting all the small businesses because 90% of everything that comes into your box or in your box to you, I guess it wouldn't come into your box. Well, they do put the no, things in your box. But it arrives to you in the box. If you'd like some of these things inserted in your box, then 90% of it's from a small up-and-coming brand. And it's free to sign up for. You can skip a month. You can cancel any time. What you do, you go to boxofawesome.com. Like I said, take the quiz and enter the code DRIVE at checkout. And you're going to save 20% off your first monthly box. Boxofawesome.com. Code DRIVE for 20% off your first box. And I mean, look at the, the hot sauces. They got Texas hot sauce, Nevada hot sauce, California hot sauce. They've got the, the, the American barbecue rub in the carnivore box. See, that's, the, that's the, uh, the genre, the carnivore. If you're a carnivore, you like to eat meat, so you need barbecue rub. If I can say one thing, I've noticed one thing that uh, we've recently seen. We have a growing female audience, uh, surprisingly, with these shows. And Suzanne actually now gets a box of awesome. So this is something not just for men. There's lots of good things for women, too. Well, what's in Suzanne's box? Mind your business. Hey! I mean, are the, is that frilly and lacy things? How dare you? Well, I'm sure it's, 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 it's uh, uh, tailored to a female perspective somehow. That's right. So it's probably some motor oil to change the fucking oil in the car with. Well, she got what some you've cool usually stuff. got her doing. No, she's got some cool stuff. There was some stuff for her desk. Of course, she has a nice knife now as part of her collection. But oh, really... watch out for that. Don't go to sleep. She likes that weekender bag. I will say that. Yeah, she likes it, especially if you're not there for the weekend. Hey, I, re I remember the, the last time that you came home and said, honey, you know what we got to do? We got to go out tonight on the town. We got to get drunk. We got to whoop it up. And she said, that sounds great. You said, good. Where are you going? But anyway, boxofawesome.com, use the code DRIVE at checkout uh, for 20% off your first box of awesome there at the dot com. At the dot All com? Alrighty. At the dot huh? com? At the dot com. Box of awesome. Okay. <laughs> so, continuing on with AEW. Jesus Christ, the thing with QT Marshall doing a TMZ parody, QTV, where he plays the, whoever the fuck was the head guy on TMZ and his jobber crew plays the Stooges on TMZ and Hobbs is stuck. In, they put a belt on Hobbs to make Hobbs a guy who sits around in the middle of a bunch of goofballs making bad jokes and admitting to crimes they showed the video of wardlow's car getting broke into of course it was one of his stooges there qt stooges this was bad this was phony and hobbs is stuck in the middle of it now this is the way they're going to try to get this fucking guy over or under as the case may be your thoughts you know i just saw the other day on twitter qt marshall had a bit of a meltdown and started going at it with one of the guys that i think owns a few wrestling websites over being criticized for you know, being on the show. And we've seen QT going back to the beginning. And they've tried to do things with QT. At times, they tried to do things with him and Cody. Of course, they had a working relationship from the Nightmare Factory. 
They put him with a Go-Go and Camarado and Solo. They did the thing where him and Dustin were teaming up and he was cheating on his wife with the bunny. <laughs> then his wife appeared on TV. Point is, they've done a lot of stuff with QT. Nothing has worked. And there's a reason for that. And I don't feel like happy saying this. I'm not going to be like the guy on Twitter fighting with QT. QT is a fine wrestler. And I'm sure he's a very good trainer. There's nothing that QT says or does that would cause anyone else to want to watch him. And to take someone who has been treated like a job guy joke since the beginning and give him this now, something new that is lame. And now he's Hobbs' boss. That is lame, that's poorly done, that's bad comedy, that's a takeoff of TMZ. Maybe this would have worked 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I don't know. And you take Hobbs, a guy that's finally getting something done for him, and you put him with QT. No one's going to take Hobbs seriously because he's with QT. I know that Tony likes QT personally, but that shouldn't justify using him on this show. And I'm not gleefully saying that. Like, I don't have a personal problem with QT Marshall. This is just a fact. He shouldn't be used on this show, and especially in this way. You need singles stars. Hobbs, as much as anyone there, you could point to and say that's the potential. They never do right by him. And this is bad. I don't know if I heard from anyone in feedback that actually liked this segment or thought it was a good idea. This was yet another counterproductive segment for no good reason. Who wants QTV? There's no good reason for any of this. And again, think of the trail of damaged booking that that got at least to Hobbs winning the belt, and now he's in the middle of this mess. And now QT's and pretending like he's Harvey on TMZ. Who's this supposed to appeal to? Like, what is the audience for this kind of... Harvey, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. Bad it'd stuff. Be like, it'd be like when they parodied Don West on Saturday Night Live. Harvey will go, oh, look, they're parodying me. Bad stuff. You know, they, they had one All the right. opening segment was intriguing and there was a lot of stuff there. But if you look at every single segment from that point on in the show, it's just nothing but reasons to scratch your head. Every single thing. Well, some of those things on the top of their head look like they have lice. And that's where we get to our little dog pockets because. <laughs> My week was ruined. I thought I had seen something, that there was some explanation, some way that they were going to make something out of this. But I will ask again. Same thing I asked with Jane's winning streak. If this whole thing of having pockets win on television every week is not building up to him actually losing this phony made-up title that they've instituted to some legitimate talent and or star to do something real with, then what's the fucking point of doing this? If he's not going to ever lose this thing to somebody that they can move up the card into a spot where this championship would mean something... Then again, now we're just, we're having to watch this fucking guy every week. It's like we had to see seven weeks in a row of the fucking EVPs because he's the owner's favorite wrestler. And I thought, Jeff, and I see now he's being a company man, but I thought Jeff had probably sold him on, okay, he's won four or five weeks in a row. So since I'm supposed to be helping out with your international events division, I can be the international champion. I'll beat him and get some fucking real heat and goddamn do something with this thing, but no. So it's still going to be a joke belt and they're not going to do anything with it apparently. But in the process, and I know this is going to light you up, Brian, <laughs> if there's ever been anything approaching a good Orange Cassidy match, this was it. He did it. He managed to figure this fucking thing out. He didn't let the fucking clown do the shit that he normally does. He did shit to make fun of it and let the clown fire back for real. It, you know, it it looked... 
I've, I've seen this going back 50 years. It looked at parts like Jerry Lawler having a match with a local radio DJ. He could, he could get something out of anybody. If the, if you, if you were ambulatory, not a paraplegic and breathing Lawler could have some kind of fucking match. Jeff almost did the same thing here. It made sense in its own way. It didn't make sense in terms of pockets being in it and, and visually ridiculous and et cetera. But Jeff, he knows how to get heat. He knows how to pace. He didn't do the same match that everybody always has with this guy. And he put some of the guy's stuff in it while trying to not make it, <clears throat> I guess, embarrassing. And he still managed to sell some for him like you would for, you know, a guy that accidentally gets the advantage on a real athlete. He got a uh, Jeff got the sharpshooter on him, got some heat from the people in Canada. Jesus pockets tried to reverse it. He couldn't, he, he didn't reverse it because he didn't know how, but he, came up with some type of grip, you know, it, and then Jeff did one of his fucking finishes where he took people on a fucking ride. He gets the figure four pockets fights out. They have the big one, two in the ring. Jeff throws the best punch in AEW. That's not surprising either. They bump the referee. Sanjay slides the guitar in. Here comes referee Aubrey Ed. Power walking with a mean face. She's the star of our show. She takes the guitar. Pockets gets a schoolboy for a two count. Pockets gets the guitar. Zippy takes it away. Aubrey Ed kicks Sanjay and Zippy out of ringside. The original referee gets up. Pockets hits a DDT, but Jeff draws the referee while Lethal comes in and hits Pockets from behind with the Golden Globe. And Jeff gets cover and a two count. And here comes Muffin Top Taylor. No, it was Trent. I said Trent Cupcake. He comes down and nails Lethal and they fought off. They just fought off. And then Jeff goes for the stroke. And I thought, well, here we go. We got something. And no pockets hits Roman Reigns finish. One, two, three. So he took him for a ride. The finish was laid out great. There was so much happening. He, you know, except for the visual, Jeff led him through this thing to, you know, it. but it proves that the chimpanzee can do the moves. But again, I ask, what is the point of this? Every week we have to look at this fucking guy. Every week he wins over in some cases, legitimate talent. And he's never going to get any more over than he is right now, and he probably ain't as over as he used to be because it's old and it's over with. It's been it, The joke has been told. He offers nothing to a mainstream audience or to boost their business. So if they're not going to beat him here, what level of talent does it take to bring in to beat this fucking guy? Well, again, I'm not surprised. I don't know why you thought Jeff would win here. Jeff is, and Jeff shouldn't, and, and look, I'm not an Orange Cassidy fan. I said it since the beginning. Jeff Jarrett shouldn't be on this show. It has been a step down to have the face of TNA and a guy who was overpushed for so many years on this show. So I think he has succeeded but, but look, in having entertaining at, matches, but no one wants to see him. But look at the fucking field. Look at the, the, he's now the best wrestler on the roster. No, he's by, not. It, it, Come on. <laughs> Jeff Jarrett. The best, the, the, the best in-ring performer right now. Who's better? Je MJF's much better than well, Jeff Jarrett. Okay. M then, then we're, we're, we're comparing modern wrestling and execution of moves. And we're talking about psychology and experience and putting shit together and being able to work with anybody. I think Jeff is good at that. I mean, that's the thing. I can't take away from him his ability in the ring. What I could say is I don't think people want to see that. And okay, I think and I'm, and I'm not used. saying that he should be made the world champion. I'm saying he should be made the international champion because he can go out there and get heat with those fucking nim, nim, num nuts or nitwits or whatever nim that nuts. don't understand that he is nimwits that don't understand that he is the best wrestler on the fucking roster because he knows what he's fucking doing and the rest of them don't. He can go out there and he can talk. 
he could get a fucking secondary belt over and get heat because he has it because he beat one of their indie darlings. And then you put him in the ring with some of these other indie riffic motherfuckers that don't have a goddamn clue of how to put a match together and let him teach them. And then he can get the international belt to mean a little something so a real good fucking baby face can beat him and get over by taking it off of him. He comes That's out there with the do. goof troop. So right away, you know that you can't take Jeff and right seriously. away you get rid of Sanjay and right away Zippy is fucking best not seen or heard. I agree with that. But if they've got this guy on the fucking roster, they should use him to best advantage instead of again, having him be in another fucking parade of top talent or experienced talent or just good talent that puts over the fucking goof. Because the base audience likes the fucking goof. I agree with you about the need to get things away from Orange Cassidy. And I think that he is one of the worst wrestlers in the company in terms of what I want. And people are going to go, oh, he could do the moves. Guess what? <laughs> I've wrestled on my front lawn when I was a kid with my friends. I know how to kick out of lots of shit. To me, that's not what makes a wrestler. Just being able to kick out of stuff. So I agree with you on that. And I agree with you that if you put Jeff Jarrett, and we've seen it, if you put him in there with the acclaimed or a top flight or whatever, that is a way to use him that will hopefully lead to a lesson that will teach the wrestler he's in the ring with something they could do better next time. But I think if you put a belt on Jeff Jarrett and if you feature him like that on this show, well, he's the only one in the company, the company that does it. He's the only one in the company that doesn't have a belt already. <laughs> well, that's a different point. That's the, that's, the, that's the point. Everybody's got a fucking. I'm just saying he would actually make something out of it. He would make people mad that he had it, rather than people not knowing or caring that everybody else has all the other belts. I think if they went with what we've always seen, which is Jeff Jarrett getting a belt and then having to cheat each and every week and use the stupid guitar with balsa wood each and every week to hold that belt, it would be really counterproductive because people have seen this. You know, it'd be one thing if you said put him and Jay Lethal and do something with them as a tag team. That, I think, is more merit than putting a singles belt on Jeff right now, just because of the way I think people would react to it. I'm just saying anything's got to be better than this. How long do you That's think they're going to go with this, with Orange Cassidy? I don't. It, it already should have ended, but now I have no fucking idea. But is it like five weeks in a row that he's been having these matches on this show. And it's like, you know, for me, it feels like the same match every time because I've seen the routine. How much longer can they do this? Who's going to beat him now? Jade. <laughs> yeah, that Jade versus Pockets. Uh, undefeated streak <laughs> on the line. Hey, Holy hey, shit. To my point, though, about Jeff, do you think, considering where the tag team division is, and the people in it who need experience, don't you think that'd be a better way to use Jeff going forward? And again, if Jay's hurt, Jay's hurt. But him and Jay is a tag well, team. Well, now is Jay hurt now? Was he hurt? He was out there with a sling, wasn't he? Oh, God damn. I just saw him run in and hit the fucking guy over the head oh. with the golden, glo glo golden globe. Golden globe. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I didn't pay close enough attention to the Orange Cassidy match. But if you have a Jeff Jarrett and a Jay Lethal, do you think it's better to have Jeff and singles competition and all of his group are out there or if you have those two as a team and i'm not even saying you have to put them over well, yes everywhere. no i said last week that they ought to have jeff and lethal instead of that four-way or five-way or whatever the fuck it was have jeff and lethal work a program with the acclaim just to fucking teach them how to have a tag team match but since this week jeff's in a single well why can't he goddamn win that fucking thing just do something we're we we had to look at the EVPs and their self-indulgent fucking masturbation fantasies two months in a row on TV. We got to watch this fucking clown just because the owner dresses up for him or dresses up like him at Halloween. We got to watch him six weeks in a row. Let's do something with some of it. Something. And get Make Sanjay it, and, and, out of and, there. Yes. And calm, calm his ass down severely. Speaking of having an ass calmed down, one of the girls got fined because the, the next segment was the in-ring interview with Soraya and Tony Storm and Ruby Soso. 
and they actually find Soraya for saying the word twat. I didn't know that you could say fuck <laughs> over and over on TBS like John Moxley has done, like some of the other talents have done. And just, well, that'd be just swell, but you could say twat and get fined. Has anyone ever said twat on a wrestling show before? I don't know. And it, the thing is, it, I would not have assumed that it was one of the banned words. It's used more often in the UK. And I think I, I probably use it because I've been around the wrestling business and there's a lot of people from England or Calgary in the wrestling business. But is that like pussy or the dreaded C word? Is that that bad over there and across the pond? Or is it, did anybody even know what she really meant over here? I think they knew because the fact that she got fined means that Tony heard her from someone else. Well, but again, they've been saying fuck. Isn't fuck like the world heavyweight champion of cuss words? What, you know? No. I think fuck and its cousin shit are kind of like the established brand. Like they started, they were the, the top of the line, but now they're kind of, they've been there a while. But when you get a twat... That kind of rattles things, because where did this come from? I don't know. Well, like, when we were uh, reviewing the Sinclair Broadcasting uh, standards, when I was doing Ring of Honor and we had to make sure we didn't air anything right, you couldn't shove something in somebody's ass, but you could call somebody's somebody an ass, or you could kick their ass, but you couldn't shove <laughs> anything in their ass. This, this is legitimate. So uh, I'm thinking that, you know, uh, sometimes like you can say bitch or you can say son of a bitch, but, you know, you can't shove something in a son of a bitch's ass. I don't know. But one way or another, she got fined for saying twat. That was the takeaway from this. Otherwise, Hader and Baker came in. They got in a big fight. The heels beat up the baby faces. Here came Riho and Willow, and Sky Blue, and Riho was leading the charge with a lead pipe that, if it was real, would have weighed more than she does. And <laughs> It was the fakest-looking pipe I've is, ever seen. I know, oh, my God. This, here's this thing is half as tall as she is anyway, and it's a lead fucking pipe, and, and she's just swinging it like a fucking baton. And then the heels left, and Sarai got fined for saying twat, and... Again, how many fucks have we heard and now it's an issue? Well, you know, maybe that's actually the way things will be going forward. Let's see how many more fucks we hear on the show. Let's see if Moxley is still coming out there. I mean, the girls, when they came out, they were immediately flipping off the fans. We'll see if they say anything about that, but... Well, Moxley flips everybody off every week. Did you have any thoughts of this beyond the uh, twat gate? The no, because I, I didn't listen to it. Because no, because I've already... Look here. Here's the thing. We started off with the best segment on the program. Then we saw the BBC. Then we saw Jane. Then we saw Pockets, and Jeff didn't beat him. So at this point, I'm just, I'm waiting for this fucking thing to be over with. This women's division is such a disaster. Everyone knows Soraya should never have been signed. It was a mistake. She does awful promos. She can't work a regular match. There are people there who, at least as of a few months ago, didn't want to work with her because of fears of hurting her in the ring. Ruby, to me, Ruby's promos are never good. And she, I think, is not very good in the ring. Tony's good in the ring. And now she's the third flunky in this group. Jamie Hayter's really good and the fans got her over. They have botched what they've done with her and Britt. Britt's now just running out there. Boy. Like yeah, Hater at at one point Baker versus Hater would have actually again been a, a pay per view yeah. women's match they could have headlined with and it not been a rib and that's lost now. Instead, they went with something where these three women are now the outcasts <laughs> because things used to be better in AEW and now they're I don't even know what they're trying to argue. This is so bad. 
The AEW every, women's every division is so bad. Every female talent, every female talent that they have brought in over the last year that at their surprise debut or their first night, the people went crazy and cheered the fucking rafters off for them. Every single one of those is now a heel. Have you noticed that? Yeah. It's terrible. And they had to because the people decided that first. They started not liking them before the, the fucking booking took them that way. And for uh, anyone who wants to compare the AEW women's division to WWE, that's bullshit. Oh. <laughs> like, no, because I see that. Like, oh, they, Tony should treat them the way WWE does. WWE has Rhea Ripley and Bianca Belair and Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair and a bunch of people that if you ever want to make an argument for there being a legitimate women's wrestling company, they've got the talent. Don't compare AEW to them because it's not fair at all. Well, you know what else ain't fair? <laughs> the goddamn six-man, not only did the main event feature the six-man tag team championship on the line, but it was a three-way six-man tag team title match, so that meant there were nine of these assholes involved. The House of Black, the Jericho Appreciators, Jericho, Sammy, and of course... Daniel Garcia that we can't get away from and the buckaroos and, and twinkle toes. And they started this match. They had over 20 minutes of television time left. So obviously that meant that they were going to go out there and pretend that people give a shit about them and their crazy goddamn nonsensical wrestling for 20 minutes. So I fast forwarded to the finish. And apparently somewhere during the finish of this, <laughs> the BBCs were still fighting with little Brutus and Houdat in the parking garage from the fact that they had been fighting an hour and 30 minutes or so previously. Yeah, segment Did you catch two. that? Segment two, they started fighting. Yeah, they got great cardio because they, they're still fighting an hour and a half later and they only made it to the fucking parking garage. Um, I, I was going to try to describe the finish that they did these nine guys doing shit back and forth over and over for no apparent reason, but I can't. And the house of black won 15 seconds before they went off the air. So they were again, about as close as you could come to not even getting a finish on the fucking air. Before we even talk about the match, cause my DVR cut off at the very end, but I saw enough things on Twitter. So I was able to find out what happened. A lot of AEW fans, who are really into the elite side of things, really happy that Hangman Page backed up by the elite. So they're teasing now that he's back with them. Well, wait, hold on. Page wasn't involved in this. Yes, he was. He came out at the end. Did he? Your DVR may have cut off before mine did. At the very end, have. Page comes out there still brawling with the Blackpool combat folks. Oh, I didn't see any of this. Oh, yeah, no, they all come out into the arena. And then they go to the ring and Moxley and Claudio and Yuta are about to confront Paige in the ring. And all of a sudden, Omega and the Bucks jump up to back up Paige and chase off, not chase off, but make sure the Blackpool folks didn't jump in the ring. Oh, good Lord. So we're about so to get they, more of this drama. And, and I bet you they went over because my DVR ends precisely at the top. So they went over because they can't manage their time. Well, I'm glad I didn't see that. This was... Because that's bad news. I believe this was for the self-indulgent championship of AEW, this match. <laughs> what a shit show. And again, I know people really like the Elite and their stuff. And, you know, Jericho, he still has his fans. And House of Black, I don't know who likes them. But this was just a silly match. Just a bunch of guys doing a bunch of things. It was hot in the house. Because you had two people from Vancouver there. But or Winnipeg there, excuse me, not Vancouver, from Winnipeg there. <laughs> but, you know, does anyone really care about the trios division? And they're shoving it down everyone's throat. Everyone's in a six-man tag team now. Not very good. Uh, on the positive side, Omega looks like he's doubling up on the human growth hormone. He looks a lot bigger than he has in a while, so maybe he's got something coming up. But who wants to see any of this? I think even the most hardcore AEW fan is sick of all of this. And again, you're, you're eating up multiple 
talents and multiple potential tag teams for the six-man title just so these guys can indulge themselves having these fucking goofy matches. And the 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 people that are there, they're going to be there for it. They ain't going to get anybody else. But that horse may have left the barn already when they look at this program. Anyway, did anybody watch it this week? It was indeed watched by people this week. This week's AEW ratings, Jim, the overall rating was 852,000 viewers. Okay, I think last week they were at 8-something. The week before they were at 8-something. So have they settled into a a groove here? Or uh, was it again a, a an example of starting strong and petering out? They've set into a groove because they've established a pattern. People ignore the fact that wrestling fans or fans of television shows will follow patterns. And it's a little hard to track sometimes because there are people that will watch things on YouTube or DVR after the fact. But if you are someone on a Wednesday night willing to watch live wrestling, they've established when you could tune out of the show. They've established who you don't have to care about. They've done things with the way they formatted the show, with the way the commentary handles things on that show, with who's featured and how they're featured, that you almost know when you could tune out and not miss anything. And I think that's what's happening here. Jim, the show opened 8 to 8.15 p.m. segment one. MJF, Darby Allen, Jack Perry, and Sammy Guevara's live promo, 1,053,000 viewers. So they've been starting there again over the past month or so. The Big Bang must be down because they often were starting with 1.1, 1.2 million. We, we got to get to the root of this Big Bang thing. I would like to see that. And I just want to mention also that this was compiled by Brandon Thurston at WrestleNomics. Segment two, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m., the continuation of the Rebar Mitzvah, as well as the Blackpool Combat Club entrance, picture in picture, and then the Dark Order and Adam Page versus the Blackpool folks, 957,000 viewers. Ouch. So since the, the Bar Mitzvah, I remember, ended about 20 after. So that means that they had 10 more minutes of that quarter afterwards to lose people. And I don't know that anybody would have tuned out in the last three or four minutes of that in-ring promo. So apparently they saw the, the state of the rest of the program and where it was starting and decided they'd start bailing there. By the time you're done with the first 20 minutes of show or show or so of the show, you've seen on the bottom of the screen what the rest of the show is going to be. Yeah. That's their chance to hook you. They don't do it. And I say what I think. People don't want to see the Dark Order and all this stuff. Let's see what the results are. Segment 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. The Dark Order and Adam Page versus Blackpool Combat Club continued with picture in picture, as well as, and I like this, you didn't even mention this, the Juice Robinson promo. Oh, geez. I, I didn't realize he was a wrestler. I thought it was some kind of candy bar commercial or something for a minute when I saw his face. And then I said, yeah, yeah. I actually like his promo. He's a little different. I just wish they would do something that would actually show that. But I didn't mind that. But 839,000 viewers. Oh, Jesus Christ. So they lost in 45 minutes, 214,000 people. I look at it more from segment two to segment three, because we don't know what segment one is coming in at. Between segment two and segment three, they showed enough people at home that they don't need to pay attention to this show that they didn't. Ooh. Jim said, where do we go from here? Segment four, Jade Cargill versus Nicole Matthews, the Cargill live promo and angle with Taya Valkyrie. Ricky Starks backstage promo. Powerhouse Hobbs and QTTV, 835,000 viewers. Ooh, I, well, down another four, but I guess be thankful for small favors. Segment five, 9 to 9.15 p.m., the 9 o'clock hour, Orange Cassidy versus Jeff Jarrett with Picture in Picture, 837,000 viewers. Ouch. They picked up 2,000 at the top of the hour and with their little dog pockets. 
some consistency, though, between segments three and segment five, right? You, you got that. Yeah, the 839, 835, and 837. Basically, it's people taking bathroom breaks at this point. Segment six, the House of Black video, the acclaimed video, the live promo from the Outcasts, as well as the promo with Jamie Hayter, Britt Baker, Riho, Sky Blue, and Willow Nightingale. Twatgate. 770,000 viewers. Oh, boy. There goes another 67,000 into the ash heap of history. Because no one's going to tune in to see the promo with the outcasts, and anyone who pays attention would know this. Segment 7. The Matt Menard and Angelo Parker backstage promo. See, I don't even bother to... I just zip through some of these because, good God. Ray Phoenix's backstage promo. And the beginning of the House of Black versus the Jericho folks versus the Elite with picture in picture, 746,000 viewers. Jesus Christ. And there goes another 24,000. We are now down 307,000 viewers from the start of the program. And finally, segment eight, 945 to 10 p.m., the continuation of the six man tag team title match with picture-in-picture picture and the post-match angle with the Dark Order and the Blackpool friends, 779,000 viewers. So what do you think? They just they got about thirty or 35,000 of them to just say, well, we'll drop out and come back for the last 15 minutes to see what happens? And just a note here from the key demo, they began at 4.04, they ended at 3.23. So even when it comes to the key mm. advertising demo, they're shedding fans. Well, I mean, they can't, it would be statistically impossible with a loss like that to not lose from every demo. You wouldn't be able to, unless suddenly everybody over the age of 50 had a simultaneous fucking heart attack. With live, they, you know. with live television, you need things to be there to cause people to need to see it live. MJF stuff, typically, I think people want to see live because you never know what's going to be said or what's going to happen. There are other people there you can say the same thing about. When Punk was there, same thing. With all of this other stuff, the women's angles and promos, the House of Black, the Dark Order, I hate to say it for those fans, even the elite, Orange Cassidy, there's nothing with any of these people that causes a fan at home to say, I really need to see this now. And that's a problem. It's formatting. It's who's getting booked. It's how they're getting booked. The booking's bad. I, I hate to keep saying it because I actually feel bad for Tony Khan, but he's not good at this. And the results, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. It keeps coming out. They're hemorrhaging viewers and it's their own fault because it's a bad show. Why did I get a horrible visual when you mentioned hemorrhaging and pudding in the same sentence? You know, I got this drain right here and I got blood still coming out of it. Oh, guys, who do you? You know what? After watching this program, I think we all need better help. I needed some kind of help, at least, after watching this program. But folks, as we've mentioned many times before, one of our fine sponsors on this program for quite some time, and this episode specifically is sponsored by the folks at BetterHelp. If you want to give online therapy a try at BetterHelp.com slash JCE, and get on your way to being your best self, because after all, we all want to be our best self, Brian. Even if some of the selves on AEW, well, I don't even know if they could be their own best self. They couldn't win a one-horse race. But if you need help talking to somebody, bouncing things off people, licensed therapists, not people on Twitter or people on Facebook, or people that will just wind you up and watch you run around like a chicken with your head cut off. We're talking licensed professional therapists that you could be matched with online. All you got to do is go to betterhelp.com and take the brief questionnaire. You'll get matched with a licensed therapist. You can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule because, again, as we get so many emails and we've talked about so much, a lot of people feel alone or at wit's end and can't do anything about their own issues because they don't have anybody competent 
to talk to, and social media is often not it. So if you have been thinking about giving online therapy a try, go to betterhelp.com slash JCE and you can get 10% off your first month's services. Betterhelp.com slash JCE, 10% off your first month's services. And Brian, if you and I, we we talk to, well, I don't talk to a lot of people. You talk to a lot of people compared to me. I don't talk to many people. I work the phones. That's why I'm not in the therapy business. I don't know if I'd give people proper advice. <laughs> That's why you're not in the therapy business. I'd want to get off the phone. I'd just say, well, call me back later. You'd be the worst therapist ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Better anyway. help. Better help. Yes. So, and by the way, uh, speaking of people who need to talk to somebody besides the people that they're currently talking to, uh, our friend Tony Khan is has been on Twitter, and I know we've we've just done the AEW television, but this week on the drive through, we're going to be heavy with WWE content, biographies on Kane and Jerry Lawler, and if the incomparable face off happens between Roman Reigns and. Cody Rhodes and whatever's going to happen on Raw Monday night, we'll have that. So let's get AEW's dirty laundry finished scrubbing. Tony has been melting down on Twitter over a variety of things, specifically people being critical of the television program and his various efforts at Sane. Am I correct in this? I don't know what's causing it, but last night as we are recording, Friday night, People started buzzing about Tony Khan's behavior on Twitter, and it doesn't see eh. again, I don't I don't like to pick on Tony, but he doesn't do himself any favors. And this is another <laughs> he example. He keeps giving us material. I don't know why he thinks this is the appropriate way to deal with things, but it never seems like it works out the right way. He was on Twitter again last night over a series of things. I'll start with this one. Someone text, or texted, someone tweeted Dave Meltzer and said, are the wrestlers still taking care of their own car rentals and hotels, or is that covered? I thought the company only took care of flights. I could be mistaken. Dave responded, overseas it's taken care of. Domestic, they still pay for cars and hotels. Tony... Yeah, and, and, well, now, by the way, did... Uh... Was the the company, was this in a chain where they were talking about AEW? Because WWE, that is a true statement. They do internationally. They don't domestically. But did Tony just jump in on this, or were they specifically talking about AEW? To be fair, I'm not exactly sure what started this chain. I'm trying to look back, and I don't have it here. But Tony quote tweeted Dave's tweet and said, That's false, Dave. Your statement's true about other companies, but doesn't apply at all to AEW. AEW invests millions of dollars every year on good quality <laughs> hotel rooms and safe transport to take care of our wrestlers. It's a huge investment I make on hotels weekly. Hashtag AEW Rampage. So then, <laughs> before you even go further, though. AEW Rampage. That's pertains to the topic someone responded quickly and just said tony dave is hacked because apparently dave's twitter got hacked and then tony responded that may be but he wrote that before he got hacked and tonight <laughs> is, and tonight is friday night when i often correct the record on things i find to be inaccurate before oh aew rampage on tnt oh boy so this started things and right away you know, we started well, hearing things uh, again. Let's just make the point that WWE, that statement was correct. I don't if I was a hacker on Dave Meltzer's Twitter account, would I write that thinking that was going to inflame people or anybody? I th I'm pretty sure he did write that because it's technically yeah. it's true about one company. If Tony wants to spend millions of dollars putting guys up to goddamn Waldorf Astoria. then that's entirely up to him. Go ahead. And again, to discuss this specific thing, because I think we talked about it on the show a long time ago, on multiple occasions, we heard from people who knew, they saw the logs, how many people were being flown in and put up at these shows that weren't even used on the events. So in terms of spending millions of dollars on 
hotel and travel, we could talk about how much of that is well spent money and how much of that is just spent money. Well, and you know what? Here from somebody who spent a lot of time on the road, I hated it on the pay-per-views when the WWE would get the bug in their bonnet to put the guys up in nice places because then you've got a situation where you're parking in the parking lot, you're walking five miles to your room, you're going through fucking either in the old days, tons of fans in the lobby or now security that looks like you're entering a goddamn restricted airspace and you know it, it, it's it, five dollars to tip anybody to fucking breathe on you i just want the goddamn hampton inn where i can park at the door come in come out get a pizza delivered and go to the fucking building right so i'm sure a lot of the young guys that have never had the experience of traveling and having shit paid for for them they love staying in fancy hotels but after you've done it for 10 or 15 years, it's going to get fucking old. And then I guess the person who originally started this was trying to say that Dave wasn't necessarily talking about AEW, he was talking about domestic wrestling. Tony Khan replied, really, Corey? You could have fooled me. Because he said domestic wrestling companies in his tweet, and I own two of those. Oh, gee. Thank you for your totally unbiased thoughts. Ah. Then... Earlier that night, he announced a big upcoming match, Kenny Omega versus El Hijo del Vikingo. What? He announced on Twitter. The, the son of Vikingo? The actual tweet is this Wednesday, March 22nd, Independence, Missouri, Wednesday night, AEW Dynamite TBS Network Live. Dream match. Kenny Omega versus El Hijo del Vikingo in a dream match that was postponed in 2021. Kenny Omega will finally go one on one with the amazing El Hijo del Vikingo live on TBS this Wednesday. What kind of dream match is that? And what do you have to eat before you go to bed to have dreams like that? <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. And and people have been clamoring for this for two years now, eh? Now, this is someone who, you know, the fans who follow everything happening around the world have been excited about because he's someone who does a lot of moves he does a lot of, i mean i'm not even trying to be funny he does the best tumble salts you've ever seen out of any of these guys out there Hell, he, he does the best tumble salts but to the average fan clearly the average AEW fan who's not reading the observer or something they wouldn't know who he is so i guess and i may be wrong and i think this is what i am picking up on tony started seeing some reaction from people saying who what is this match we don't even know who this guy is a dream match we've never heard of this guy so someone by the name of Lucha Blog tweeted at Tony and said, you're not expected to know who everyone is. I know a lot of people and there are still others I'm learning about every day. But also, if you have the time to type who and click post, you also have the time to Google. Posting who <laughs> is just waving, I'm a goof, ignore me as a flag. What? <sighs> so Tony responded to that. They aren't doing it to be genuine. A large percent of those replies aren't from real people. A lot of them are from accounts that, upon inspection, seem to only exist to question and rip AEW, and most of their other content seems to be a cover story to, <laughs> seems to, be, seems to oh be a cover story to justify the existence of these accounts. One of my favorite bits they do is when they claim they used to love AEW in the old days, but not anymore. Yet when you dig into their old posts, there's nothing positive on AEW ever. Yes, I'm sure you all used to be great fans, despite no evidence of that whatsoever. So, so what he's saying here is besides the fact that when people say, as we did, who? He's saying it's not legitimately saying, who is this fucking guy? It's part of a conspiracy. <laughs> it's a plot to malign AEW, and he knows this because he, the owner, operator, founder, manipulator of AEW and Ring of Honor and fucking the Jacksonville Jaguars and his father's fucking dizzy whiz fucking franchise and whatever else he's got going on also has the time 
to go back into individual fans' Twitter accounts who knock AEW and investigate them, or potentially he's having someone else in his in his employee spend their time going through fucking random people's Twitter that knocks the company to determine whether they ever liked it or not, and whether or not they may be part of this vast stupid wing conspiracy. A person on Twitter named Littman <laughs> tweeted to Tony, or just tweeted, I guess, about this. Has anyone ever been this perpetually online before? To which Tony responded, I've been online since the Grandstand Wrestling Forum on Dial Up America Online. <laughs> Hashtag AEW Rampage tonight. <laughs> I think the, the, the questioner was talking about, has anybody ever just been on it 24 hours a fucking day and wouldn't shut up ever? And doesn't somebody have to sleep sometime? And couldn't somebody find other things to do with their time than what they're doing? And can you imagine Vince McMahon or let's, uh, let's open it up or Bill Watts or Jerry Jarrett or Ted Turner or Jim Crockett or anybody else that ever ran a fucking wrestling company spending the time to ferret out these bots on Twitter themselves and comment on them. And again, I don't think the people in that company who will tell people on the outside, for instance, me, that they're embarrassed by Tony's behavior when he does this kind of stuff. He's the boss of the company. He's the, you know, he's part owner with his dad of this company. I don't know if any of them say that to him. I think it's the opposite. I think people like pat him on the back and, oh, you did a great job showing them on Twitter. But to a man, they all tell you they're embarrassed by it. It's just... <sighs> Again, he he does his actions and his comments and his public interaction with people give people, whether it be us or anybody else, the fodder to say he's a fucking confused, socially awkward, rich kid that has collected a bunch of living action figures and can't fucking deal with the fact that it, he can't really do this on a big-time basis that he always fantasized he could. And now he's stuck with no... It, when we talked about it, who would take the book if he got a, a booker? Who's there that, that could or would? Who You know, he's stuck now, and he's going to have to fucking argue with people on Twitter about his goddamn... Because he believes that people are as fixated and obsessed on this niche wrestling and these niche wrestling personalities and this fucking minutia that he's gathered in his mind with his group of equally obsessed people. And meanwhile, you know, the other company is putting on WrestleMania with a guy saying, I want to win the title for my daddy. You know, we hear from and people... That's, that's as easy as it can be. Go ahead. We hear from people in that company who like Tony Khan personally, and they'll tell you he's been childlike, he's getting more and more childish, more and more stubborn about things, he doesn't want to listen to people. And then you see this stuff on social media. You know, here's another one. Uh, going back to this Kenny Omega match. This match was scheduled in 2021. It was highly anticipated. <laughs> Due to Kenny's injuries, it was postponed. Now Kenny is back, and the match is Wednesday on Dynamite. Those who watch our show regularly also know Kenny's in a major story unfolding weekly that we should keep an eye on. What would that be? I guess the thing with him and Paige? I'm not even sure. I, I mean, here's the problem. Tony is not good at Twitter. And like his booking, he thinks he is. And my suspicion, based on everything I know and people I talk to, is that maybe people are afraid to tell Tony that he's not good at these things or that it's probably not a good look to do this because he's not going to accept that. He looks for justification and he looks for excuses to justify things. But this is such a, I mean, I hate to use bad look. He looks really bad doing this. He comes across really, really bad. And I don't think he sees that. 
So you're saying that somebody in the company sooner or later is going to have to be the one to tell him that he can't buy Richard Pryor. I don't think it would work. No, that's actually the opposite of what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying if someone in that company said you can't go buy Richard Pryor, he would find a way to do it and justify it. And then he would go on Twitter to announce it. <sighs> he shouldn't. I mean, I feel bad because, you know, I don't people think we pick on Tony. Again, I don't feel good about saying these things, but it's like he opens the door for himself. He he's just and not, he slams it on his own foot. He's just not good at this. He's not good at this. Well, I know what you're good at. And that's the programming over at the 605 Arcadian Vanguard and Wrestling News Production Networks. What are you doing this week, young Brian? Another action-packed week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes, of course. Get the wrestling news at thewrestlingnews.com or subscribe to Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Free daily wrestling news update every single day. Get all that's happening in the world of wrestling for free from The Wrestling News. A lot more to come. We just went past 200 episodes. Subscribe today. The Wrestling News. Want to make mention of this week's episode of Breaking Kayfabe with Baldrin and Barry. Vandal Drummond, Kurt Brown himself, stops by and they discuss Gordman and Goliath versus Chavo Guerrero and Roddy Piper, the masked Canadian in Los Angeles. Check that out today at baldrinpod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> Ooh, I felt that in my shoulder. Go through the archive <laughs> today at 605pod.com. Hope I didn't bust this open. Wherever you find your favorite podcasts, the mothership. Are you are you bleeding or dripping or something? Anything that you know you need to take care of before we finish the program? Probably, but let's finish this program. All right. Well, what's a little blood among friends? Okay, I got to be honest with you. SmackDown for March seventeenth. If you just overlooked the pesky wrestling matches, was the best wrestling program that I've seen in quite a while. As long as you didn't pay any attention to the matches, you were great. And, and that's not even a rib. It's not even a joke. It's, it, 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 again, over at the other place, you got the constant chaos and everything, but once in a while, a great segment breaks out. Over in the WWE, everything's more controlled, but now that they actually have a really hot story and a few people in it that can produce... You you know, you get some great stuff out of this. And again, they started with Cody, the big star, opening up a network program, Fox Network. And the story is simple. Can he bring it in to the 929-day reign of the champion Roman Reigns and finish his story and win the title for his daddy? And this is the best thing that WWE has done in years because it's real and people can tell it applies just to Cody. It's not something that writers came up with and then picked the guy off the roster that they were going to put in the deal. And he, it again, did a great promo where he's, you know, he's got the utmost respect for Roman Reigns and he looks forward to beating him at WrestleMania. But he doesn't want to talk about somebody. He wants to talk to somebody. And Cody calls out Kevin Owens. And if you know, they milked the music a little bit like he wasn't going to come out. And if you notice when he came out, he ain't getting a reaction like he was. Because I think, remember, we've said they're starting to get a little pissed that he's been so petulant and stubborn. They were running out of time. They had to do this. Yeah. They had to do this. Well, I mean, and the timeline was was here also, but they were, the people were starting to be impatient. But then Cody says, well, hey, this is a conversation between three people, and he brings out Sammy. And, you know, if only somebody could have predicted this. Cody Rhodes is the peacemaker to bring Sammy and Owens together. And I'm not even, I'm not even being a smartass, because if you, Anybody who understands anything about wrestling would have known that this was going to happen pretty immediately, which is why I said it. Uh, because that's the only way they could have done it. 
But again, Cody puts over Owens and how much Owens helped him when he quit the WWE to go out on his own. Uh, but why don't we have the conversation? And basically, you know, Sammy pleads his case with Owens. We've we've done horrible things to each other. We've always come back together. Scream at me, punch me, do what you need to do so we can get back together and do this, you know, uh, together. And Cody tells him it's what the fans want, them back together. It's, you know, we're in the service industry here, pleasing the people. And Sammy said, we can be the ones that bring down the ones. And then Owens turns him down and walks out again. And I thought, boy, something better happen here because either that or he needs to join the bloodline because these people are about to shit all over Kevin Owens. And they go to the break. When they come back, it, it, even in the parking lot, Sammy stops him in the parking lot, said, you're, you're wrong. We are friends. We're brothers. I love you. That's all I want to say. Just I love you and we'll always be friends and brothers. And Owens drives off on him. So they've, they've built it perfectly, but I knew at that point something had to go on or elsewise, you know, Owens has gone off the cliff to where they're like, well, fuck him then. Find somebody else, right? But this this was great. This was great. You kind of knew he would come back in one way or another, but even though you knew that, it didn't take away from it. You know, sometimes the simple thing and the right thing is just the right thing and the simple thing to do. Between the in-ring thing, and I thought Cody was great, and for a second there, I thought he was going to call out Roman and not Kevin Owens. Calls out Kevin Owens. They had to settle this all tonight. The thing backstage with him and Sammy outside, I thought that was great. Yeah, I thought that was great, and Sami Zayn has been so good throughout this thing, but Kevin Owens' facial reactions, the way he reacted to all this, was really great, too. And these guys are all, they're all hitting the high marks right when they need to. And they've got it, they got it percolating, and we've got, what, two weeks? So Have they done enough, you think, to, how do I word this? not let any of the stuff with Sammy and Owens or specifically with Sammy take away from Cody's run at the title? Yes, because that's the overriding thing. Even if they're not talking about that match, they're reacting to something that's going on as a result of that match or that ma it, All the pieces are coming into place where not only is the focus on the main event for the title, but also what happens with the rest of the bloodline and who's going to be responsible for neutralizing them so that Cody can accomplish the mission. It's, it's all important, even if it's not, you know, each individual involved in every segment. I think also, again, the fact that Cody is the one to try to talk sense into both of them and show that he wants them together and that he's not trying to win something for himself and take it away from Sammy, but the, he, en he endorses them being friends and them in the fight, that's prevented people from going, well, why ain't Sammy getting the push? And, you know, the thing they did with Batista and Brian Danielson years ago. So, you know, I, th I think they've done, again, like I said, and as we'll find out here later on at the end of the program, things happen, but now the Owens has been just a little petulant. He better fucking change his mind pretty soon. But do you, do you remember how he debuted in the company? I thought about it during this whole thing. Owens. Yeah. I do not. Sami Zayn won the NXT championship and they had a big celebration. Pat Patterson was in the ring, you know, Montreal guy. And it was the night that Owens debuted in NXT. He was out there celebrating, hugging, and then he immediately turned on Sammy <laughs> <laughs> to start things. So when they say that they've had issues going back to the beginning, quite literally in terms of their WWE career or careers, since the moment he got there, they've been having their issues. So something I thought about. Ay, ay, ay. Well, they, we couldn't stop them from wrestling each other in Ring of Honor. They wanted to fight in the parking lot for free, just anything, so they can do their stuff. Anyway, so then we had a momentary break in the action for wrestling. Dominic and Rhea Ripley... Um, Versus Pablo Escobar and Zelina Vega, they went two minutes to a break, and they came back and went two minutes, and Rhea beat Zelina. So thankfully, we got that out of the way, so we can get back to some more promos. Which <laughs> Dominic and Rhea cut a promo on Ray, and Ray came out, and Dom and Ray went face to face, and Ray loves him, 
Dom still wants to fight. And it again, I I like Rey Mysterio. Dominic Mysterio has grown on me. The package with Rhea, obviously great. I don't want to see this dramatic written scripted bullshit between the father and the son that I don't believe. That's my comment. Is that your comment? I've been a fan of Dominic as a heel. I've been a fan of Dominic with Rhea. I think Rhea has been fantastic throughout this whole thing. But there's nothing that makes me want to see this specific father versus son. And I know that's what this has all been building to, so it's a weird comment. But I... I like you the, don't believe it. They've I like the drama. It. I like the drama more than I'm going to like any actual match, I think. I don't like the drama because I don't believe it. It's it, you know, if Dominic had a, a tear where for six months or a year he was just a dastardly heel to all of Ray Mysterio's best friends and bosom buddies in the locker room, and finally Ray came and said, "God damn it, Dom, what the fuck," and then maybe they could have a little skirmish or something. But this long drawn out. And it ain't Undertaker and Kane, I won't fight my brother type of thing. It's just, and the son's a foot taller than his father. And it just, it's all. Oh boy, then Raquel and Liv wrestled Emma and Tegan. And at the nine o'clock hour, here came Charlotte Flair for an in-ring promo. And she did have a good line. When I was a baby, this business was built on Rhodes as a challenger and Flair as a champion. And WrestleMania, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Same thing. Perfect time to have Brandy come out there and tackle her. <laughs> oh, no, you'll, you'll blow the fucking deal for SummerSlam. <laughs> uh, but I see Charlotte, and I agree with you, she isn't natural as a baby face. Yeah. Because she's got such a great almost condescending, bitchy, heelish demeanor about how much better she is and how good she is, and that's why she was such a good heel. And remember I said it worked great in South Carolina because that's flair country. They would have cheered her if she'd have came out there and killed Bambi. But, you know, the point is this match is still going to be great and it's still going to draw and it's still going to have interest, but I think Charlotte is a more natural... They used to call, you know, even Ric Flair was a pretty boy type of heel. The woo and the blonde hair and everything. She's a pretty girl type of heel. Look at me. I've got the clothes and the cars and the men and the money. And Rhea is a heel, but she's drastically, rapidly becoming a baby face because she's so cool. But they're still interested in both of them. And when Rhea comes out, I believe visually that Rhea Ripley can kick the shit out of Charlotte. And you can't say that about most other women on this roster. Then the problem becomes, Rhea, and I'm sure Charlotte is doing this also, but Rhea still to the extent, I believe, where they feel like they need to write her material. And maybe they feel like they need to tell her to memorize it and deliver it like it's written. Because she's well-spoken, she's articulate, but they're writing this for her. Or she's writing it for herself and whatever, but I think they're writing it for her. She's doing a statement, not a promo. She's not, she's not only not comfortable yet with just going out there and winging it, she can't... None of these comments are off the cuff or on the spur of the moment or a little zinger and back to the story or whatever. It's all prepared. And I can tell that. And that's going to be more time, more experience, and maybe just them having more confidence to say, hey, Rhea, go out there and tell Charlotte what you would really fucking say. Because that's where we might, well, we'd know. We might see something or we might not. But if you send somebody out there and say, say this, and it sounds like everybody else's shit, you're never going to know where if you went out there and said, you know what, go out there and fucking get the goddamn match and the issue and yourself over. Then it's either going to be great or it's going to suck, but you'd know. I'd like to see that with Rhea. But then they got into one of the greatest fights I've ever seen in my life. Uh, for amongst the women. 
Uh, Dominic got in Charlotte's face. Charlotte goes to pie face him. Rhea cheap shots her and stuns her, and they walk out. But Charlotte says, fuck you, and rolls out. Big fight on the floor. The referees, the agents, a multi-phase break loose pull apart. Charlotte Thez pressed her off the fucking announce desk. They tackled each other over the rail of the arena. The fans were going crazy. That was fucking great. I want to see this match. They look like stars. They've been built. They got the chance to talk about it. And then they get in a little fucking skirmish and everybody's up. Nice piece of business. What'd you think? Good segment. I want to see the match. I'm intrigued how the fans are going to react to both women in there because I think it's hard to... It's hard to boo Rhea uh, when she's up against Charlotte like this. Because like you said, the problem isn't even just that Charlotte's not natural as a babyface. The problem is she's so natural as a heel <laughs> that it makes you realize how unnatural she is as a babyface. And, and, and by the same token, the reason why people are starting to like Rhea is because she's in the, at the point where she's becoming the cool heel, but she doesn't need to switch babyface because then she'd be out you know, tickling toddlers under the chin and being all, you know, nice, and that would kill what people are liking about what she's doing. So they're in a good spot because at least they care about this. And Rhea's so good. I mean, every time you watch her do anything physical, just the way she bumps, the way she sells her facial expressions, she is as good a female wrestler as there is anywhere in the world. With that said, do you think... We're getting too much Rhea and Dom on both shows. I would prefer at this point they concentrate on Rhea and Charlotte because that's the match for WrestleMania and maybe Dominic could walk around a little bit on his own. I'm not saying split them up entirely, but yes, I agree that they are back and forth. She's out there a little much to... you know. To, on two shows, we have them feuding with Edge, we have them feuding with Ray, and then we have this yeah. with Charlotte. I mean, it's just... And I like Rhea Ripley, and I like her and Dom together, but it does get to be overkill after a while. And if if I were were them for right now, I'd pare down. Well, but who knows where they're going with goddamn Dominic and everything. So anyway. Hey, if we have to see Rhea, at least we're not seeing Shotzi. And what we saw next, just real briefly, I wouldn't even mention this, but it was on the program. <laughs> L.A. Knight versus Xavier Woods. And I immediately wrote, even for L.A. Knight, I can't do the day thing, but at least they're giving L.A. Knight something. I thought, okay, a nice showcase for L.A. Knight. Wait! Xavier Woods, small package, one, two, three, in two minutes. They beat him in two minutes with Xavier Woods. What has this guy done? And then, after the break, he's walking in the back, and one of the girl interviewers says, well, what do you think about what the fuck? And he said, well, hold on. And he sees Ray Mysterio. And he goes over and tells Ray, if you won't fight your goofy son, I will. And I'll be a deadbeat dad too. <laughs> and Ray punches him in the face, knocks him down, says something to him in Spanish and walks off. And it was rottenly executed. And even LA Knight fumfered a couple of words because he could probably obviously tell, okay, I'm getting beat by middle card guys in two minutes. Then I'm going to come in and get fucking knocked on my ass by a guy a foot shorter than me. And I, he should have laid there so the girl interviewer could have covered him for a three. What are they doing here? I don't know. You never know. You never know if it's one of those things where they want to humble someone. You never know if it's just the way they want to treat him because of his age. But despite awful booking from this guy's in-ring work, and more specifically, his mic work, he's gotten himself over. People are interested in seeing him. But for some reason, that doesn't stop WWE from constantly <laughs> embarrassing him or treating him like a job guy. And I don't get it. Because I think, again, he's not a young guy. But out of all the people there that they've debuted on TV in the last six months to a year, he has shown potential. He has shown that people get into him. His work is good. His work is solid. I don't get it. It's it's not like we're saying put the belt on him. He doesn't need to beat Roman next week. Just give him some wins, which I don't know that he's ever had, and let him talk without getting interrupted or having his fucking face slapped for a few months and see what happens. 
All right, then the winner gets the Intercontinental title match versus Gunther at WrestleMania match came up with Drew versus Seamus. And, of course, they've been friends, and then they've been sideways because Drew wants the Intercontinental title. That's what Seamus wants. Actually, to be honest with you, at WrestleMania, I'd rather see Gunther versus Elia 3. And I'm mad because I still had Gunther versus Elia 2 on my DVR in the bedroom when it fucking malfunctioned. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that sucks. Um, which was a whole nother level of modern wrestling and something that they've neither company has equaled since then, the quality of that match. But nevertheless, I'm not, I, I don't care about Seamus and Drew McIntyre hit a ceiling and stayed there. He's got the look. He, he can talk okay. He's got the size and the body and the, his work. But it just, something didn't happen. And I don't, you know, either one of these guys, it just, they've been over, possibly overexposed lately. But anyway, they have their match. This is not the main event, by the way. The main event on SmackDown is a promo. But they have their match, and they got the people, and they got into the false finishes and had some big pops going on with, you know, the fans, and then they hit each other with the double kick, the brogue kick and the Claymore kick, and are both down, and the referee's counting, doing a 10 count because they're both down. Gunther's been doing color at ringside. Not really, he made some comments, which they didn't really give him a lot to say either. But he's, you know, wanting to see which one of them's going to face him. He made a big stink about that last week also. I want an opponent. I want the belt. So the referee gets to nine on a double count out, and Gunther just gets in the ring and stops the count. <laughs> and that used to be a DQ if somebody would come in the ring. I, I, or he just, the referee's just standing there watching him. He's saying, what? Get up. He's daring them to get up. Which one of you is it's going to be? But then as he's daring either one of them to get up and find out which one he's going to have to face, Marcel and Marceau, his stooges, jump in from behind and start beating the fuck out of the baby faces. And I'm like, what the fuck is this finish? And then Drew and Seamus fire up on the stooges, but Gunther levels both of them, and then power bombs <laughs> Seamus on top of Drew's back as he's on his hands and knees on the ground. So the <laughs> Gunther wanted a an opponent to be determined who was going to face him at WrestleMania. But both the guys are on the verge of losing the match on a double countout. Instead of letting that happen, he gets in the ring and stops the referee and demands that one of them get up. But then he has his guys beat the shit out of both of them. But when they start firing up, he beats the shit out of both of them and then walks off. But Adam Pierce pops up on the screen and says, well, you ain't going to get away with it that easy because you will defend the Intercontinental title, which is what he's been saying he wanted to do all along anyway, at WrestleMania against Seamus and Drew in a fucking three-way. So now, because both guys lost, and then he beat both of them up, and now, instead of getting to see Gunther against either one, which I would have looked forward to, because there's a WrestleMania match I want to see with Gunther in it, now it's a three-way, and it's going to suck. And did this fucking finish make any sense whatsoever? Well, again, I am not going to say too much about this because I didn't really want to watch it. I'm sick of both of these guys. No, I'm sick of both of these guys. And I know they're talented guys. I'm sick of Drew McIntyre and Sheamus. They both have bored me lately. And they teased it last week when they piped in triple threat chants when they did that promo. You heard it. I knew where this was going, and I'm with you. We were teased. I shouldn't say we were teased. Articles came out saying that WWE was thinking about Gunther versus Brock, and that was enticing. This isn't. I like Gunther. I don't like three-way matches. And Gunther and Sheamus has been good in the past, but I'm just kind of sick of Sheamus and McIntyre. Yeah. 
Uh, well, anyway, so Gunther, it was nice. Looking forward to seeing you at WrestleMania. We'll we'll look forward to something else you do some other time when it doesn't involve another goddamn three way lazy booking. And finally, we come to the main event. Sammy Zayn and Jay Uso in the ring. Jay has said he wants Sammy to pull up. Is that a thing the kids say? Because they said it about 18 times. He wants me to pull up. Well, I'm going to pull up. That's right. So that is a thing the kids say. Yes. Well, he pulled up. You want me to pull up? I pulled up. And actually, Jay did a great job with this. He did a phenomenal job. I want he to stop did a right phenomenal he, job. He's been good, but on this promo, the words, but just you believe everything he's saying. He's really, really good at convincing you what he's saying, and I thought he was phenomenal here. Yeah, and the story makes sense. From day one, I was the one I didn't like you. I didn't trust you. I saw through you, but they all started liking you, all but me. And then finally, I let my guard down, and it, that was what made the most sense. You betrayed me. You made me look stupid. You embarrassed me in front of my family and in front of the people. You made me look stupid. That This is a goddamn legitimate reason for somebody to be mad at somebody in the context of what we're doing here. And, you know, I called you my brother, but you were a fake ass oose. He was great, and he had passion. And then Sammy said, no, no, no. You choose to take Roman Reigns' abuse every week. I wasn't going to do that. You're not mad at me. You're mad at yourself for taking it. You're mad that you weren't the one that hit Roman Reigns with that chair first, right? And, you know, right as they're they're up there face-to-face -face and Jay turns away, kind of like listening to the people, and then spins around and clocks old Sammy. And boom, here they get in a fight, and here comes Jimmy. And they clobber Sammy with the ring stairs, and they're beating him up, and then Owen's music. And I'm thinking, God damn, why'd they play the music? But while the Usos look down the entryway, Owens comes in from behind and does the, if, if only he looked like something. When they got that shot of him coming in behind him and taking his jacket off like the badass, you know, fucking action movie stars about to, if he just looked like something. Yeah, but, but he did it. He got it over. They liked it. He fucking comes in and beats up both the fucking Usos and sends them running. And then he and Sammy look at each other and he walks across the ring. He gives him the big hug and the fans lost their fucking minds. The babies were in the air. And the only other thing that could make it even more perfect as the babies are in the air and the French Canadians have settled their hostilities and they're hugging and copulating in the middle of the ring. You see the shot of Cody in the back, watching the monitor, watching the whole scene with a smile on his face. That was perfect. Perfect. And that's the way the show ends. So now they're, and we got two weeks till WrestleMania, baby. If you think of the last three months, you know, from right before Royal Rumble to here, think of how many monster pops we have heard for things in this series of angles. Yeah. The chair shot, the hug. Jey Uso making up with Sammy, then turning on him. The reactions to every little thing in this, I don't know what you want to call it, this bloodline story, which encompasses so much, has been the highlight of professional wrestling. And again, you've got, obviously, Heyman's been heavily involved. Roman Reigns is doing tremendous work. He, I've never worked with the guy. I've never met the guy. But I bet you he's got a pretty good goddamn head on his shoulders because he's carrying this also. Sammy's done a tremendous job. Everybody involved in this has been, and then Cody to be able to, because you know, Cody didn't write his story when he came in last year about Roman Reigns and the belt involving Sammy Zayn, Kevin Owens, etc. because that wasn't a thing then with this bloodline interaction that happened while he was out, and now he's been able to come back, pick his story up where it left off, his angle, 
and at the same time incorporate these other guys that weren't even in the goddamn issue when that aspect of it was designed, him and Roman, and it's fitting better than it would have if it had happened, you know, if he'd have had the whole goddamn last year and this bloodline thing hadn't happened, it wouldn't be as good as it is now. So he got... It, it, Things fell into place for once. Sometimes a guy gets hurt, it screws up all your plans. Sometimes a guy get hurts, it, it gets hurt, it ends up better in the long run. So one it, of the oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm just it just depends. So one of the nights of mania you're going to get Roman versus Cody as the main event. Should the main event of the other night be Charlotte versus Rhea, or the Usos versus Owens and Zayn? Well, should and what will is two different things. I think they've already said it's going to be Charlotte and Rhea, but in all honesty. And we've just put Charlotte and Rhea over and said we want to see the match. It should be Sammy and Owens and the Usos, but they're not girls, and all the girls have to be equal, or else why the, the men will be upset. Have you noticed now if the girls are not treated equally, the men are the ones that get upset? Well, not the men with women. The lonely men get upset. Oh, listen to all the lonely people who want to see too many girls' matches. Okay. What do you think that tag team match needs to be? Because obviously everything's been building towards the Usos versus Owens and Zayn. They haven't teamed up. They just made up. It can't just be a straight tag team match, can it? I mean, what, what would you do with this now? You know what? In all honesty, and I know some people are going to go, oh, now, Cornette, now you want to... It's WrestleMania, and it's a personal issue. It's a grudge match, a grudge fight. Don't even put the belts up. As a matter of, lights out, let Charlotte and Rhea be the main event. And then lights out match, street fight. But don't do it to set up numerous goofy stunts and make the furniture the centerpiece of the thing. Do it so you can have fucking Sammy and goddamn... Owens come out and hit the ring from behind, jump start the heels, do 10 or 12 minutes of the goddamnedest, wildest pull apart four way action all around the ringside area that you possibly can fucking put together and then put the baby faces over, boom, one, two, three. Because it's not for the belts. They've still got to climb that hurdle, but they can win the fight, send the WrestleMania audience home happy. And because, uh, again, if normally you want the heels to foil the baby faces uh, several times at the start because the baby faces have to work to get even. But in this case, with this reunion happening and them just getting back together, you've got to give the fans some gratification. You've got to give these guys a win in some fashion, but you don't want to blow your whole load and have them beat the heels and win the belts and put an end to the thing. So let them win a fight, but the, the belts still weren't on the line because it was, and lights out, anything goes, we just demand personal satisfaction. WWE doesn't sanction the fucking belts being on the line. Then you still got somewhere to go. But yeah, I would do a wild, and not a wild 30 minutes at the end of the show, a wild 10 or 12 and fucking score, the Fantastics and Midnight at the Clash of Champions in 88. Yeah. Wild in, yeah. out, boom, gone. Except we didn't put them over there. We had already put them over on television the week before, so we did a little angle and got some heat. But that style of match, just whirlwind, boom, 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 no slow spots. Don't build fucking structures with goddamn furniture. Hit people over the head with some chairs and tables. Fight a little bit. Baby faces win. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. That was SmackDown, and this is your show. Well, thank you very much for listening to it. And have you had enough yet? Yes. You want some more? Huh? No. Well, well, are you talking to me or someone else? Well, you or anybody else that might be listening. Folks, if you haven't had enough yet, then we're going to be back in a couple of days with the drive through and we'll concentrate on the WWE side of the street with the biographies on Kane and Lawler, as well as whatever happens questions. on Raw amongst these crazy people. And questions from the listening populace. And until then, we will close this program now, not as MJF says on TBS, because he'll get fined, but as I say on my podcast, because I am fine and so is it, 
Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.